Hello and welcome to session 20 of the basic tax course. We're going to begin session 20 with a review of the session 19 quiz answer key. And session 19 dealt with rental property as well as some of the limits that affect passive activities such as rental income. And we're going to begin with question number two, which was the most frequently missed question. Mr. Wilson rented an apartment in the basement of his home for the entire year. The apartment is 1,000 square feet in size, 25% of the total space in the residence. The total expenses for the entire building were as follows. And of course, in the quiz, we gave you only the actual expenses in full for the entire building. And your job was to determine what portion of the total expense would be allowed for the rental. And in this case, we're telling you rental is 25% of the whole. And therefore, when we look at the normal expenses of maintaining the property or supporting the property or paying for the property, we're going to be dealing with 25% of the total. So in the case of mortgage interest, the total amount at 100% of the property is $2,500 and 25% of that amount is $625. Property tax is 900 for the whole, 25% equals 225. And utilities, which were all paid by Mr. Wilson, but were 25% allocable to the rental portion, $300 is deductible as a rental expense. You'll also see that there are some repairs, but they were made to the apartment only, totaling $150. I've circled 150 because we're allowed the 150 in full. We're not going to need to prorate that. Also, insurance. But the insurance covered both 2012 and 2013. And if you recall, when we're dealing with insurance that it covers more than a one-year period, IRS says you can claim a deduction only for insurance up to one year in the future. So that means of the $1,200 of insurance, only $600 could currently be deductible. And of that $600, 25% is allocable to the business. That leaves us with $150 deductible expense for insurance. And then finally, we have the fair market value of Mr. Wilson's labor to do the repairs, $200. Well, valuable as Mr. Wilson's labor is, it's not deductible because he paid nothing out of pocket for it. So zero, nothing on the personal labor. Finally, the building excluding the land cost $40,000 and was assessed at $48,000 when Mr. Wilson started renting. And so, of course, we're going to go with the lesser of the cost basis or the fair market value on the date the property is converted to rental use. 40000 is the lesser number. We're going to multiply that by the business use percentage of 25%. And then we've told you that the $1,000 depreciable basis of the building is being depreciated straight line over 40 years. And that's 10000 over 40 equals $250. So ultimately, we're going to add these numbers up. 625 plus 225 plus 300 plus 150 plus 150 plus 250 equals $1,700. And that makes B the correct answer. Just referring over to the answer key, after this video is over, the answer key does total all of those numbers up in a column the way you see I've done here in this illustration. The next question we're going to look at is question number seven. A taxpayer meets the material participation rules in which of the following situations? A, the individual participated in the activity at least 450 hours. Well, no, 500 is the minimum. So A will not be a material participation test or will not meet that test. B, the individual participated in the activity at least as much as any other owner of the activity, but less than employees of the activity. That is a false answer. The individual must participate at least as much as anyone else, including employees. C, the activity is a personal service activity and the individual participated in the activity for any three prior years and they need not be consecutive. That actually is one of the exceptions to the material participation test or one of the types of material participation that is considered to be material participation even though it occurred in earlier years. And finally, D, the individual materially participated in the activity for three years in any of the 10 immediately preceding years. There is a rule similar to that, but it is not precisely the way it's worded. C is the correct answer. The correct wording on that is that the individual must have materially participated in at least five of the immediately preceding 10 years, so three is not enough. 
Moving over to the mini problem now, Jessie Mitchell rented out a basement apartment in her home for the entire year. The apartment takes up 50% of the square footage of Jessie's home. During the year, she had the following income and expenses for her rental unit. And we can see that the monthly rents were 1,000 times 12 months. Utilities for the apartment only were $1,000. Advertising was 50. Insurance for the entire house, 300. She also had depreciation allocable to the apartment only in the amount of $1,200. Mortgage interest for the entire house was $7,000, and property taxes on the entire house were $1,800. And, of course, we're going to have to prorate most of these expenses by the business use percentage and then carry them to the correct line of Schedule E. And you can see here in my notes I've indicated what line of Schedule E you should be making an entry on for each of the items listed. Now, in the case of insurance on the entire home, of course, we're going to have to prorate that by 50% and carry $150 to line 19. And we're going to have to prorate the mortgage interest, real estate taxes as well. Now, in the next sentence, it says that in June, Jesse allowed her tenant to paint the house in exchange for one month of free rent. Jesse paid $400 for the paint used to paint the house. That should convert in your mind to a deduction of some kind, and the deduction would be maintenance or repair. But it's only going to be deduction for maintenance or repair for the rental portion of the house. And so since the entire house was painted, we're going to be looking at $1,000 of foregone rent that is an expense, and we're going to be looking at $400 of paint that is an expense, but then we're going to need to multiply the total of those two numbers, $1,400 by 50%, and that leaves us with $700 that we can claim as a repair or maintenance expense. Let's move over to the answer key and take a look at how all of those numbers totaled up for Jesse, and we can see that with the monthly rent, we've got income of 12,000. On the utilities, we show the total expense that was paid and how much of that will be allowed as a rental expense. The utilities, we told you in the wording of the problem, that was for the apartment only, 1,000, so you don't need to do a division. Advertising is allowed in full. The insurance, we had to do a proration. The depreciation is allowed in full, as I described it in the problem. We're going to have to allocate the mortgage interest and property taxes down from $7,800 to $3,500 and $900, respectively. The cost to paint the entire house is $1,000, of which $500 is allocable to the rental, and the cost of paint for the house is $400, of which $200 will be allocable to the rental. So in the end, we're left with $7,500 of total rental expenses. Remember that the free labor provided by her tenant is not really free. She gave up a month of rent, and that month of rent has to be included in the gross receipts. And so that free rent really wasn't free. She paid for it. Here is the Schedule E for Jesse. We can see how each of these line entries on the problem itself carried over to the Schedule E, beginning with $12,000 of gross receipts. $50 of advertising, $700 of cleaning and maintenance, just as we calculated down here that that should be for the cost of painting the home, then multiplied by the business use percentage, 50% of the insurance expense, 50% of the mortgage expense, 50% of the tax expense, and then finally on line 17, the full amount that was paid for the tenant's utilities, as well as the depreciation on the rental. And when we total all of those expenses up, we get $7,500. We subtract $7,500 from the gross receipts of $12,000, and we're left with a $4,500 profit to carry to the Form 1040. So that concludes the review of the Session 19 quiz answer key. Let's proceed with the Session 20 lecture. Welcome. The title of today's class is Self-Employment Income and Expenses. And I... I like doing tax returns with self-employment to them. They're, it, it's interesting to see the types of businesses that people have and the amount of income that they're having from them and you know, to hear about their success stories if they're having them and if they're not doing so well, maybe some of the ways that I can give them advice that will help them. I find invariably that as a tax consultant, I am able to provide my clients with very helpful, useful advice that helps them to make their businesses more successful. And so I've tried to put a lot of information into today's class that will help you as a tax practitioner be of better service and better counsel to your own clients so that you can help them stay out of trouble per se <laughs> and, of course, maximize their deductions and reduce their tax while they're at it, but for the most part be in compliance with tax laws. And if you are self-employed, the odds of an auditor are substantially higher than when you're not. 
So I think it's all the more important that clients really understand some of their obligations in terms of record keeping and tax compliance and so forth. So today's class is going to be covering small business income and expenses. We're literally going to look at the Schedule C and go line by line and determine what you put on each line and why, what's permissible, what's not. We're also going to take a quick look at the domestic activities production deduction. Certain small businesses or certain businesses, small or large, are allowed to claim that deduction. We'll touch on farm income, but not in any great detail, not the way we're going to be touching on Schedule C. But still, we can't ignore the concept of farm income because there's plenty of farmers out in our country, aren't there? Self-employment tax is another thing we'll take a look at. And finally, we'll also take a look at payroll taxes. Not included in this list is record-keeping requirements. We're going to talk about that. And then also some of the local taxes, some things to be aware of at the local level, at your state level, your city level, that you should be aware of and be looking for. I have a reading assignment for you in today's class, essentially two main publications to go to for content. The first one is publication 334, which is the tax guide for small business. And that tax guide is very helpful, but also information for farmers in publication 225 can be a nice complement. And then there are the instructions for certain information returns, particularly forms 1099. And I'll be giving you quite a bit of information in today's class about 1099 requirements. Now, I have decided to come down to the cold, not voluntarily, but I did decide to come down to the cold yesterday. So I'm going to be fighting that off as we go through today's class and just bear with me on that regard. So let's move over to an overview on page two of your manual. And this is my opinion. I, this is a sentence coming from me. And it says, self-employment income is perhaps the most complex type of income you will need to report on your personal tax return. And you might say to yourself, well, there's not that much that's that complicated about Schedule C, is there? And the answer is, you know, putting how much expense you have on a particular line of Schedule C isn't terribly complicated. It's everything else that goes with Schedule C that makes Schedule C complicated. And let's take a look at a few of the things that could make Schedule C more complicated that always have to be in the back of your mind. Because if you have self-employment income, you will probably need to report income and expenses on several different forms, not just the Schedule C. There is the Schedule C, of course, but if you're a farmer, then it would be a Schedule F instead. And then if you have any net profit from your business, there would be that self-employment tax form. And then it's possible you're going to qualify for some form of tax credit, a business tax credit, so you would need Form 3800 to claim the general business tax credit. And, you know, if you're claiming with some of the more common credits or any of the other credits that attach to the general business credit, they themselves have forms. There's also Form 4562 for depreciation and amortization. If your business experiences a theft or casualty loss, it would need to complete Form 4684. Form 4797 goes hand in hand with businesses when they dispose of business assets or sell the business in its entirety. Form 4797 is a required form. Then, of course, we need to pay estimated taxes during the year, usually when we're self-employed, and that's a 1040 ES. And if you work from your home, you're going to need an 8829 for business use of home. Then there's this disabled access credit, and that goes hand in hand with the general business credit. If you're claiming the disabled access credit, you would need two forms. Then there's Form 8594. If you buy or sell your business, that's a form that needs to be completed by both the buyer and the seller. Then we have like kind exchange form. If you have an asset in your business that you trade for another asset or you have a business, let's say a rental property that you wish to trade for another rental property, that is a form that you need to complete. Then if you happen to be in the restaurant industry where you have employees who are receiving tips, you're going to need to file Form 8846. There's also Form 8903 for the Domestic Activities Production Deduction. There's 941 reports. If you have employees, you need to file those. And you also need to file 941s and W3s and W2s. And if you pay any independent contractors, you're probably going to need a 1096 annual summary statement as well as the 1099 miscellaneous forms themselves that you have to fill out. And that's not all the forms. Those are just, you know, kind of a good list that I put together of forms that you're probably going to run across and need to be able to describe to your clients and recommend to your clients or provide and fill out for your clients at some point in your work as a tax practitioner. Moving on to the Schedule C itself, you are going to need to file a Schedule C to report income and expenses from self-employment if either of the following is true. 
your net earnings from self-employment are $400 or more, or you have received a 1099 miscellaneous reporting income of $400 or more in box three, other income, box five, fishing boat proceeds, or box seven, non-employee compensation. So if your client has a 1099 and it's got a number in a box and that number exceeds 400, you probably need to do a Schedule C. And it could be that they end up having a loss, and so they don't really owe any tax, but there's no way for the IRS to know that they have a loss unless you file the Schedule C to claim those deductions. Something else that is just annotated or uh, described in the instructions for Schedule C is something called a husband and wife qualified joint venture. The IRS is of the opinion that any time two individuals get together to work a business together, that by definition you have a partnership. And until only a few years ago, IRS considered a husband and wife team working together in a business to probably be a partnership. There was an exception to that rule in that you could have a sole proprietor, say the husband who owns the business, and he could employ his wife. Or you could have the wife who owns the business and employ the husband. That's perfectly acceptable, and that would not be a partnership because you've got one clear owner employing employees, and it's okay for spouses to be employees. But when you had a husband and wife who really worked the business together and one spouse was not paying the other spouse on a W-2, they were just working the business together and then they'd file a return, what was to be done about the income? And until a few years ago, essentially the IRS said that that was a partnership and Form 1065 needed to be filed. But then the decision was made to allow for something called a husband and wife qualified joint venture. This particular category of filing applies only to married couples who file together in most cases. They have to be married and they have to be operating that business together. And if that is not the case, then they wouldn't qualify for this. But let's just take a look at the specifics in this paragraph here. If you and your spouse each materially participate as the only members of jointly owned and operated business and you file a joint tax return for the year, you can make an election to be taxed as a qualified joint venture instead of as a partnership. This election in most cases will not increase the total tax owed on the joint return, but it does give each of you credit for Social Security earnings on which retirement benefits are based and for Medicare coverage. By making the election, you will not be required to file Form 1065 for any year that the election is in effect, and you will instead report the income and deductions directly on your joint return. If you and your spouse filed a Form 1065 for the year prior to the election, then that partnership is considered to terminate at the end of the tax year immediately preceding the year in which you make the qualified joint venture election. So let's just suppose you're a husband and wife and you've always understood you had to file as a partnership, and so you do. And then a year comes where your tax practitioner says, well, since you're not an LLC, since you haven't done any kind of formal organization, you're just working together as husband and wife, it's not necessary to file a 1065. We could file two Schedule Cs on your individual return instead. That would be less complicated, and it's okay to do that. So the husband and wife says, yeah, we'd like to do that. And the IRS is saying the only thing you need to do is file the two Schedule Cs the next year and check the qualified joint venture box and that the partnership is considered to have terminated at the end of the last year. Clearly, it would make sense to check the box on the 1065 return that says final return, just so that's not left open with the IRS wondering. So how to make the election? Well, I sort of just told you. To make this election, you must divide all items of income gain, loss deduction, and credit attributable to the business between you and your spouse in accordance with your respective interests in the venture. Each of you must file a separate Schedule C, E, Z, or F. And on each line of your separate Schedule C, C, E, Z, or F, you must enter your share of the applicable income, deduction, or loss. And each of you must also file a separate Schedule S, E to pay the self-employment tax as applicable. So this is not giving permission for a husband and wife to file a joint Schedule C. That's not what happens. Instead, you take the income and expenses of the business and essentially divide each of those items that appears on the profit and loss for the business between the husband and wife. And each of the husband and wife will file their own individual Schedule Cs. And on each of their own Schedule Cs, they will report their share of the income and their share of the expenses. And if there is a net profit, for each of their individual Schedule Cs, then there will be separate Schedule SEs attached to the return as well. Now, if everything's 50-50 and there's no real delineation other than that, then clearly each Schedule C would essentially have identical numbers on it. But it is possible that the numbers could be varied. If one spouse has significantly more contribution to the business than the other, you could see that they would be unequal Schedule Cs. 
So the election does generally does not require that you or your spouse obtain an employer identification number since you and your spouse will file as sole proprietors. However, you may still need an EIN to file other returns such as employment or excise tax returns. And if you need an EIN, you can follow the instructions for Form SS4. And we'll talk about EINs in a little bit. Now here is the Schedule C, and as I promised in today's class, we're actually going to take the Schedule C line by line, all the way from the start here at the top of page one, all the way through till we get down to this final section, part four, information about your vehicle, and part five, other expenses. So we're going to really, really be looking and delving into this form closely today. And if you have not already printed a copy of Schedule C or Form 8889 and you want to have it as a handy reference, you can, of course, flip to the front of your manual. But it wouldn't hurt on the first break of the day if you haven't already done so to just go print a Schedule C so that as I'm going through the class today, you've got it next to you and you're not trying to figure out or orient where you are with what I'm talking about. And we're going to begin at the top of the Schedule C with identification and disclosure information. I do see a question coming in, is there any situation where spouses could file a joint Schedule C? And the answer is no. There's no such thing as a joint Schedule C as far as the IRS is concerned. It is two separate Schedule Cs. And I know some tax software used to have, or at least the tax software I've seen has even had a box where you can check joint Schedule C, but if you try that, IRS just gets all in a knot. So don't do that. It needs to be two individual Schedule Cs, two individual SEs. And one other note I wanted to make you aware of is that the formation of a limited liability company, or LLC, is a very popular business structure. And as far as the IRS is concerned, if a husband and wife go into business together, they can file individual Schedule Cs under a qualified joint venture. But if that husband and wife team forms a limited liability company in which they are the only owners, they are no longer eligible to file as a qualified joint venture and must file Form 1065. So I'm not going to get into 1065 in today's class at all. That's the subject for a couple of weeks out when I teach Introduction to S Corporations and LLCs. We'll get into all of the rules about who can do what, how, when, and where, and why with those entities in a couple of weeks. For today, it's just enough for you to know that there's no such thing as a joint Schedule C, not allowed. If you have a qualified joint venture, it must be a husband and wife who file a joint return. You would have two separate Schedule Cs on their tax return and not a single Schedule C. And if you look at the Schedule C, the very first thing that it asks for right up here on the first line is the name of the proprietor and the Social Security number of the proprietor. Well, you can't have two Social Security numbers on this line. It's one spouse's number or the other spouse's number, and it would be one spouse's name or the other spouse's name. It can't be both. So that right at the beginning is telling you they're not allowing for it on the very first line of the very first page of Schedule C. But let's go through and talk about this little spot right here. Lines A through H of Schedule C are used to report information about the kind of business you own, the method of accounting you use, and whether you materially participated in your business. If you have an employer ID number for your business, report the EIN in Box D. If you received a 1099 miscellaneous from a customer, do not report your customer's EIN in this box. And we're going to move on with line A right here. Principal business or profession including the product or service. On this line, you need to describe the business or professional activity that provides the principal source of income for this business. You describe the principal business or profession that provides the income that's reported on line one of Schedule C. Line one is, of course, where you report income of the business. And IRS says that the principal business or profession that you enter on line A should be the business or profession that creates the income, the majority of the income that is appearing on line one. As follows, if you own more than one business, you complete a separate Schedule C for each business. The IRS doesn't like you combining all kinds of income onto the same Schedule C. Naturally, when we're preparing Schedule Cs for our tax clients, it would be normal and customary to charge for each Schedule C that we prepare. And so there can be some motivation for a client to want to have everything on the same Schedule C, and how do you know when that's okay? Well, let's say I've got a client right now who is a consultant. He consults on this, he consults on that, but all around it's all consulting. And does he need to break it down to consulting for this or consulting for that? Or can he have one thing that's all consulting? 
I think one thing that's all consulting is fine. He doesn't have to have two Schedule Cs because he consults on two different topics. He's still in the business of consulting. And so that would be where I would leave it. But if you really do see that there's two separate businesses there, the IRS does not want to see those combined and does want to see a separate Schedule C for each. You should also give the general field or activity and the type of product or service that is being offered. And if your general field or activity is wholesale or retail trade or services connected with production services, such as mining, construction, or manufacturing, you also need to give the type of customer or client. For example, wholesale sale of hardware to retailers or appraisal of real estate for lending institutions. The next line on Schedule C is line B, and on this line you need to enter the code from pages C12 through C13 of Schedule C instructions, and these are the codes right here. I've pulled them out of the Schedule C instructions and thrown them in the manual for you. The codes that you see below are from the principal business or professional activities. These codes are for classifying businesses, and they come from NAICS. They are six-digit codes. And you need to go through the codes and select the category that best describes your primary business activity, for example, real estate. So if you were to go through here, you'd be trying to find real estate. And I just decided to do that now, so it's always a little bit of a challenge. Here we've got real estate. So right there is real estate. Then it says, after you found real estate, select the activity that best identifies the principal source of your sales or receipts, for example, real estate agent. And now you find the six-digit code assigned to that particular activity, which would be 531210, the code for the offices of real estate agents and brokers, and then you enter that on line B. So if we go down and go back to real estate, we're looking for offices of real estate agents and brokers. So we found it right there, 531210. The IRS does want you to be that specific. I find that Thumbtack software makes it really easy to find the code and put it in. Many years ago, I used to use Lacert, and when I was looking for a code, somehow Lacert made it easy to find the code. Now I use Drake software. I've been using Drake software for close to 15 years, and Drake software, their system of identifying codes is just terrible. I can't ever find the code I'm looking for in Drake. And I don't remember what it was that Lacert did that made it easier. All I know is it was easier. So within Drake, I just basically give up right away and I go to the Schedule C instructions or Quick Finder where all of the codes are listed. I find the code and manually type it in. That's just what I need to do. Now, sometimes I see tax returns where 99999 has been entered as the classification code. And I basically take that to mean that the tax preparer was too lazy to look up the correct code because there'd be very few situations where you can't identify the type of business activity that your client is engaged in. And you should take the effort to find the correct code and put it in there. Business name for line C, if no separate name, leave it blank. If you have registered your business under an assumed business name or you have formed a disregarded entity, which is a single member LLC, then enter the business name here. Otherwise, leave this blank. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we mean by single member LLC. An LLC is a disregarded entity as far as the IRS is concerned. It's not a corporation. It's essentially the formation of a business entity at the state level. And the IRS says that LLCs really have no official designation in the IRS's eyes. They look to the makeup of the LLC and decide how that LLC will file. One of the main reasons we get phone calls from prospective new clients, the phone call goes something like this. Hi, I need to come in and meet with a tax professional because I just formed an LLC and I need to know what's going to be different about my taxes this year. So the question I ask is, okay, how many people are owners of the LLC? And then the client will say, well, it's just me. I just formed it in my own name. Okay. So if there's only you, then in actuality, nothing's changed because the IRS disregards a single member LLC, it doesn't see it differently than the sole proprietor doesn't recognize that there's any kind of entity there that is going to be given a tax status. It's a very different thing than, say, a corporation. If you incorporate at the state level, the IRS recognizes that an entity has been created, and it recognizes that that entity exists and that that entity needs to file a return. But when you form an LLC, the IRS does not recognize the LLC as an entity. It looks to the sole owner of that entity. If that entity is an individual, then that individual is in business, then they're going to be filing a Schedule C. Now, if the LLC has two or more owners, then the IRS says, well, we don't care that you're an LLC. What we care about is that there's two owners. And if there's two owners, well, that makes a partnership. So you need to file a 1065. 
Now, there are some provisions, again, that we'll get into in a couple of weeks about when a partnership LLC or a sole proprietor LLC could make an election and file as a corporation. But you would never have a single member LLC file as a partnership, and you would never have a two member LLC file as a Schedule C. So if you have just all you've done at the state level is formed an LLC with one owner or form uh, doing business as name at the state level, then you would enter whatever the name of that formal recognized registered name is on line C of the Schedule C. Line D is the employer identification number, if any. Enter on line D the employer identification number that was issued to you on form SS4. Do not enter your social security number on this line, and also do not enter another taxpayer's EIN. For example, from any form 1099 miscellaneous that you received. So that's a common thing that confuses people. The client comes in, they have a 1099 miscellaneous that they've received because they perform services for another business, and they take that business's EIN and put it on their Schedule C, and that's not what the IRS wants to see. If your business, you as an individual, do not have an EIN, then leave line D blank. Single member LLCs again, if you are the sole owner of an LLC that is not treated as a separate entity for federal income tax purposes, you may have an EIN that was issued to the LLC and in the LLC's legal name. If you are required to file employment tax returns and certain excise tax returns, you're going to need to have an EIN for that LLC. However, you should enter on line D only the EIN issued to you and in your name as a sole proprietor. If you do not have such an EIN, leave line D blank. Do not enter on line D the EIN that has been issued to the LLC. And I find that rather interesting because it's only a recent thing that the IRS came out and said that single member LLCs need to get a separate EIN for purposes of payroll. And it would seem logical that that EIN would then be used on the Schedule C. In fact, I find it quite odd that it's not. But IRS is specifically saying that only the EIN issued in the name of the sole proprietor would ever go on the Schedule C of that sole proprietor. If the sole proprietor is reporting business income and expenses of their single member LLC on Schedule C, and they have obtained an EIN in the name of the LLC for purposes of payroll, the IRS does not want that number entered on the Schedule C. Again, I find that odd, but it's very clear in the instructions that that's what they mean. Now, if you need an EIN, how do you obtain one? Well, why would you need an EIN is more of the question. Obtaining an EIN. You must have an EIN if you do either of the following. You pay wages to one or more employees or you file pension or excise tax returns. If you are required to have an EIN, you need to include it with your social security number on your Schedule C or CEZ, unless, of course, the EIN was issued to an LLC. Then leave it off. And how do you apply for an EIN? Well, the simplest way to do it is to follow the link that you see here in the manual, and it takes you to the IRS website where you are able to actually apply for an EIN online. It's quite easy, and on occasion we actually get EINs for our clients. We'll get them to authorize us to do that, and we will apply for an EIN for them. You can also obtain an EIN over the telephone. In the olden days, that's how I did it. And you can do it the manual way by completing Form SS4 and mailing it in but either of these two first methods is far preferable. New EIN, you may need to get a new EIN if either the form or the ownership of your business changes. So if you bring in a partner to your business, that would make you change from being a sole proprietor to a partnership, and that partnership would need to get an EIN. And if you sell your business to someone else, your EIN does not move with the partnership. The EIN that the IRS issues to you is your EIN, and you don't ever give that away. Business address. Complete this section if you have a dedicated business location that is not inside your home. This is a rather important one. This is just based on my experience. I haven't seen it in writing anywhere. But if your client is selected for an IRS audit on their business and the business address is their home address, then typically what's going to happen is the client is going to have to go downtown to physically to the Internal Revenue Service building for the audit and they'll have to sit at one of the desks in one of those cubicles. But if the business address entered on here is a separate business location, because there is a business location, then typically the IRS auditor will come to you, which is much more preferable in my mind, <laughs> especially if there is an accountant, then instead of actually going to the business location of the tax client, they'll come to the business location of the tax preparer who did the return. That can be arranged. So I haven't seen it in writing anywhere that this has been written down, that this is the IRS procedures, but I've had IRS agents tell me that. 
and I've asked them, how come we have to come to you instead of you come to us? That doesn't make sense. All of my other Schedule Cs have always been audited on my site. Why do I have to get in the car and come downtown to you? The answer has been because the client's business address is their home address. And when that's the case, it comes down to them downtown. Accounting method, a line F. You must figure your taxable income and file an income tax return for an annual accounting period called a tax year. Also, you must consistently use an accounting method that clearly shows your income and expenses for the tax year. An accounting method is a set of rules used to determine when and how income and expenses are reported. You choose an accounting method for your business when you file your first income tax return that includes a Schedule C for the business. After that, if you want to change your accounting method, you must generally get IRS approval. Well, here's the thing with an accounting method. Most people default to cash because they don't know anything other than cash, and they don't have the bookkeeping and record-keeping systems in place to do anything other than cash either. So I don't know what the statistic is on the percentage of small businesses that are cash, but I would say it's virtually all of them, and it would only be a few very well-organized, very professionally managed companies or businesses as sole proprietorships that would ever be anything other than cash. So you must use an accounting method that clearly shows your income and generally you can use any of the following methods. The cash method, the accrual method, a special method of accounting for certain items of income and expense, and a combination method using elements of two or more of the above. You must use the same accounting method to figure your taxable income and to keep your books. Line F, we see counting method, and when you prepare the tax return for your client, you need to check the box that applies, and in nearly every case, it will be cash. So let's talk about cash. Most individuals and many sole proprietors with no inventory use the cash method because they find it easier to keep the cash method records. However, if an inventory is necessary to account for your income, you must generally use an accrual method of accounting for sales and purchases. Well, the IRS says you must generally use an accrual method if you keep an inventory, but then it has this exception for small business, and most small businesses are well underneath that threshold, and therefore, if you are a small business, and the majority of small businesses in the country, even if you keep inventory, you're still allowed to use the cash method. Income. Under the cash method, include in your gross income all items of income that you actually or constructively receive during the year. For constructive receipt, what does that mean? You have constructive receipt of income when an amount is credited to your account or made available to you without restriction. You do not need to have possession of it. And here's an example of constructive receipt. Interest is credited to your bank account on December 2012. You do not withdraw it or enter it into your passbook until 2013. You must include it in your gross income in 2012. And the fact that you didn't go withdraw it or write it down in your passbook does not mean you didn't have access to it. Delaying the receipt of income. You cannot hold checks or postpone taking possession of similar property from one tax year to another to avoid paying tax on the income. You must report income in the year the property is received or made available to you without restriction. Expenses. Under the cash method, you generally deduct expenses in the year in which you actually pay them. This includes business expenses for which you can test liability. Expenses paid in advance. You can deduct an expense paid in advance only in the year to which it applies. And here's an example where an expense is not fully deductible. You are a calendar year taxpayer and you paid $1,000 in 2012 for a business insurance policy effective for one year, beginning July 1st. You are allowed to deduct $500 in 2012, but the other $500 that you prepaid, you're going to have to hold off on deducting that until 2013. It's probably a really good reason why most of the insurance companies I run across build the insurance policy twice a year, <laughs> once in January, once in June, or once in July. Probably that has something to do with it, but I could just be guessing there. Accrual method. Under an accrual method of accounting, you generally report income in the year earned and deduct or capitalize expenses in the year incurred. The purpose of an accrual method of accounting is to match income and expenses in the correct year. For income, under an accrual method, you generally include an amount in your gross income for the tax year in which all events that fix your right to receive the income have occurred, and you can determine the amount with reasonable accuracy. So here is an example of right to income has been fixed. You are a calendar year accrual method taxpayer. You sold a computer on December 28, 2012. You billed your customer in the first week of January 2013 but you did not receive payment until February 2013. 
you must include the amount received on your computer in your 2012 income. Estimated income. If you include a reasonably estimated amount in gross income and then later determine that the exact amount is different, take the difference into account in the tax year in which you make the determination. Advanced payment for services. Generally, you report an advanced payment for services to be formed in a later year as income in the year you receive the payment. However, if you receive an advanced payment for services you agree to perform by the end of the next tax year, you can elect to postpone including the advanced payment and income until the next year. However, you cannot postpone including any payment beyond that tax year. And for expenses under the accrual method of accounting, you generally deduct or capitalize a business expense when both of the following apply. The all events test is met, and that test has been met when all events have occurred that fix the fact of the liability, and the liability can be determined with reasonable accuracy, and economic performance has occurred. And here is an example where all events test is met and economic performance has occurred. You are a calendar year taxpayer and you use an accrual method of accounting. You buy office supplies in December 2012 and you receive the supplies and the bill in December, but you hold off on making payments until January of 2013. You can deduct the expense in 2012 because all events that fix the fact of the liability have occurred. The amount of the liability can reasonably be determined, and the economic performance has occurred during that year. Your office supplies may also qualify as a reoccurring expense. In this case, you can deduct them in 2012, even if the supplies are not even delivered until 2013. Combination method. You can generally use any combination of cash, accrual, and special methods of accounting if the combination clearly shows your income and expenses and you use it consistently. However, the following restrictions apply. If an inventory is necessary to account for your income, you must generally use an accrual method for purchases and sales. You can use the cash method for all other items of income and expense. If you use the cash method for figuring your income, you must use the cash method for reporting your expenses. And if you use the accrual method for reporting your expenses, you must use an accrual method for figuring your income. If you use a combination method that includes cash and another method, then the IRS wants you to call that the cash method. Change in method. Once you've set up your accounting method, you must generally get IRS approval before you can change to another method. A change in your accounting method includes a change in, the overall method such as from cash to accrual method, and your treatment of any material item. To get approval, you must file Form 3115, Application for Change in Accounting Method, and you can get IRS approval to change an accounting method under either the automatic change procedure rules, which is simply attaching the form and applying for an automatic change, or you might need to get advanced consent request procedures, and if you do that, you might have to pay a fee. The next line on the form is line G. Did you materially participate? I'm just looking down and seeing a question if he's asking, can they have a qualified joint venture with an LLC in a community property state? The answer is yes, community property states do allow for qualified joint ventures. I do teach a class, actually it's part of my California CPE series where I talk quite a bit about community property state and I'm thinking of pulling out the community property issue and just teaching it as a general topic but it'll be based on California and how California treats community income. But generally what you're looking at in a community property state, and most of the country is not community, but there are a few states including California, Arizona, Idaho, uh, I think it's Wisconsin, Texas, a few states like that that are community property. And what happens in a community property state is that when one spouse works and earns money, half of what they earn is considered to be income of the other spouse. And so the question is, if I'm in a community property state and I'm working, isn't my spouse already getting half the credit for my income anyway? Well, the answer is yes, they would be receiving half the credit for the income, but they wouldn't be getting half the credit for social security purposes. That would still only go to the spouse who's working the business. So it's a very different thing in a community property state if you're filing separate returns, reporting income from Schedule C on two tax returns doesn't mean that you're following the qualified joint venture rules. So a qualified joint venture really happens only when you're filing a joint return in the first place. <laughs> And then when you're filing that joint return that each of you are filing your own Schedule C's because you're both actively participating and materially participating in the business, as opposed to a community property rule which says one spouse works, the other does nothing, and the other one still gets credit for half the income. And it can go both ways. 
All right, so back to line G, did you materially participate and what does that mean? Because there's this box, you have to check, yes, I materially participated or no, I did not materially participate. Which one of those am I supposed to check? Generally, you are considered to be materially participating in your business if you or your spouse did the majority of the work in your business or you worked more than 500 hours in the business activity for the year. Even if you worked 500 or fewer hours in your business, you may still be considered to have materially participated. The IRS applies seven tests which are used to determine if you materially participated in your business activity. If you pass any of the tests, you are considered to have materially participated, and your income or loss from the business is considered to be non-passive. And that's really relevant. The class I taught earlier this week, we talked about passive activity loss limits. And if you are passive in your activity and you run a loss, you're not going to be allowed to deduct that loss against other forms of non-passive income, such as wage or investment income. So how do you establish whether or not you are materially participating in your business? The IRS says you look to the 500-hour rule. And if you can show that you worked more than 500 hours during the year, then you are materially participating. But even if you don't work 500 hours or more in the business, if you did most of the business or you pass one of the other seven tests, then you can still be considered to have participated materially. If you did materially participate, you should check yes in the box on line G. If you materially participated in your business, your business income and losses are considered to be non-passive. This means your income and losses from the business can be used to offset other forms of non-passive income and losses, including income from wages, interest dividends and capital gains, pension, annuities, and other forms of retirement income, as well as alimony, unemployment, and any other form of non-passive income. No material participation. What does that mean? Well, if you did not materially participate in your business, your business is considered to be a passive activity. If your business is a passive activity, your losses can only be offset by income from another passive activity. A passive activity is a business or rental activity in which you did not materially participate. Now, with all of those rules in place, there is an exception for oil and gas. If you are filing Schedule C to report income and deductions from an oil or gas well in which you own a working interest directly through an entity that does not limit your liability, you should check the yes box even if you don't meet the 500-hour rule or the involvement rule. The activity of owning a working interest is not a passive activity regardless of your level of participation. Limit on losses. Your loss may be limited if you check the no box on line G. And if you check the no box, you will need to complete form 8582 to figure your allowable loss, if any, to enter on Schedule C line 31. Lines A and J, or I and J, we're getting our way down this introductory section of Schedule C. For 2011 and future years, new lines I and J have been introduced regarding required filings of Form 1099. The IRS is stepping up efforts to enforce compliance on businesses which are required to but fail to file the 1099 forms. Tax preparers should be aware that expenses claimed on business tax returns may fall under IRS scrutiny if they differ significantly from the amounts reported by the business on Form 1099. Well, this is not a new thing. One of the first IRS audits, it wasn't even an IRS audit, it was a state audit. IRS left my client alone. It was at the state level here in Oregon. I had a client audited because he had a very large amount of expense on the subcontractor line of a Schedule C, but he'd never issued a 1099 miscellaneous. IRS kind of blew over it and didn't pay any attention to it, but at the state level, the state got all in a knot over it and audited my client. And so IRS is now essentially announcing and saying, hey, we're going to be looking at the lines on the Schedule C, and if you've got a subcontractor line there, you've got a professional services line there with big numbers on them, and you don't have any corresponding 1099 miscellaneouses that went out during the year, your odds of us taking a look at you just went up because we're, this is a focus of ours. We're, we've been asked to look at tax compliance. We're wanting to make sure that you're actually making payments to these people and not just making up numbers and putting them on the return. And one of the indicators we have that you really did make a payment is that you properly 1099 the person you made payment to. And if you didn't 1099 them, we're concerned for two reasons. One is maybe you didn't really make the payment. The other is we want to know who you paid money to and make sure they reported their income. So IRS has made this a focal point and it's part of their effort to close the tax gap. So did you make any payments in 2012 that would require you to file Form 1099? That's the question, yes or no. 
If you are engaged in a business activity, you are required to issue Form 1099 miscellaneous to each person or business to whom you made the following types of payments during the year. At least $10 in royalty or broker payments in lieu of dividends or tax-exempt interest, or at least $600 in rents, services including parts and materials, prizes and awards, other income payments, medical and health care payments, crop insurance payments, cash payments for fish or other aquatic life you purchase from anyone engaged in the trade or business of catching fish, or generally the cash paid from a notional principal contract to an individual partnership or estate, any fishing boat proceeds or any gross proceeds of $600 or more paid to an attorney. Examples of expenses that may require you to issue a 1099 include commissions and fees, contract labor, legal and professional fees, and rent or lease. If you made any payments in 2012 that would require you to file any 1099s, check the yes box. Otherwise, check the no box. You can get an extension, a 30-day extension, for more time to file your 1099 miscellaneous forms. I can honestly say I've never applied for an extension. Usually by the time my clients come and see me and I establish that they should have issued a 1099 and didn't, they're well past the date of even thinking about asking for an extension. So they just file late. So far, I haven't seen the IRS really coming down on people for filing late, but I think that's coming. And so it's worth spending the time educating your clients when you believe they need to issue a 1099, explaining the procedures on why they need to file, how they need to file, what kind of information they need to put together so that they do file these 1099s, and then making written notes of the fact that you gave them that consult, because if they don't do what you tell them to and then they get the IRS letter basically saying, hey, you're in trouble because you didn't do this or that, the first person they're going to blame is you for not telling them they had to. So it's a good idea to make sure it's your policy to inform your clients of the rules regarding 1099s and to also keep a written record of any conversation you had with a client on that matter. So we're going to get into all of the rules for 1099 and who has to issue them and why, more than just a little bit I've already given you. Trade or business reporting only. You should issue a Form 1099 miscellaneous only when you made payments in the course of your trade or business. Personal payments are not reportable. You are engaged in a trade or business if you operate it for gain or profit. However, nonprofit organizations are considered to be engaged in a trade or business and are also subject to these reporting requirements. There are some exceptions. Some payments are not required to be reported on a Form 1099 miscellaneous, although they may be taxable to the recipient. Payments for which a Form 1099 miscellaneous is not required include Payments made to a corporation are generally not reportable except in the following situations. Medical and health care payments reported in Box 6. Fish purchases for cash reported in Box 7. Attorney fees reported in Box 7. Gross proceeds paid to an attorney reported in Box 14. Seems like no matter what, you need to be 1099ing attorneys. Substitute payments in lieu of dividends or tax-exempt interest reported in Box 8. Payments by a federal executive agency for services vendors reported in Box 7. Caution, this is my caution. An entity is not a corporation simply because it has the word company or co in its name, unless the company is an insurance company. An entity that states it is incorporated or uses incorporated or inc in its name is generally accepted as being a corporation. So one of the things I know for a fact in communicating with my clients is that they, in general, do not understand the difference between an LLC and a corporation. And very often they think that if they made a payment to an LLC, that they have, in fact, made a payment to a corporation because they don't understand that an LLC is not a corporation. And if the business that you make a payment to has LLC in the name, Jones and Company LLC, well, that tells you it's not a corporation. If it were a corporation, it would say Jones and Company, Inc., right? <laughs> so Inc. tells you it is a corporation. Company does not tell you what it is. And LLC pretty much tells you that it is not a corporation. So how do you establish that the business is or is not a corporation that you're making payments to? Well, one of the things you can do is ask them. The other thing you can do is issue them a Form W-9 and ask them to complete it. And on that form, they indicate what their entity status is. But the thing I do, at least locally in my state, is I go to the Internet and I visit the Secretary of State site and look that business up. Here in Oregon, we have a website that I visit called filinginoregon.com. It's administered by the state of Oregon. And all I need to do is go to that site, type in the name of a business, and it will tell me who owns that business, 
the type of entity that business is, whether it's current on its corporate filings or LLC filings, or even if it's just a DBA, it'll tell me all of that information. And then I know, hey, this business was incorporated or definitively is not incorporated. And leaving it up to my client to give me accurate information is typically a mistake because if I ask them, even about their own business, I'll have a fellow come in, he's a new client, he's just started up a restaurant, and I'll say to him, okay, what is it that you need to do for you today? Well, I need to file an S corporation return. You know, I started it up last year and I need to file as an S corporation. I go, okay. So I go and look them up online and they're not even a corporation. They're a DBA. Now, interestingly enough, they can make an election to file as a corporation, but they're not a corporation. And as far as the IRS is concerned, because they haven't incorporated, unless they have two or more owners, they are in fact a sole proprietor who needs to file on a Schedule C. So back to other people who are not required to be 1099, because we had a list here of six things, or we had one thing that included six categories. Other entities that do not need to be 1099 include payments for merchandise, telegraph, telephone, freight, storage, and similar items. So essentially 1099s in general go to service providers. Someone has performed a service for you. But if you're actually purchasing a product that's being delivered to you or you're paying for delivery of something, you're paying a utility bill and so forth, those are types of expense for which you do not need to 1099. Also, if you pay rent to real estate agents, you don't have to 1099 the real estate agent. If you pay wages to employees, you don't 1099 them. You'd better not. You're supposed to give them a W-2. Military differential wage payments made to employees while they are on active duty in the armed forces should be issued on a W-2. Business travel allowances paid to employees, if they're reportable as a taxable fringe benefit, then they would be reported on Form W-2. And if they're not taxable, they're not reportable on anything. You just give them a reimbursement check and keep records showing that it was a reimbursement for an allowable expense. Cost of current year life insurance protection. Payments to a tax-exempt organization, including tax-exempt trusts. And certain payment card transactions if a payment card organization has assigned a merchant payee, a merchant category code, indicating that reporting is not required. Nominee reporting requirements. Generally, if you receive a Form 1099 for amounts that actually belong to another person, you are considered to be a nominee recipient. You must file a Form 1099 with the IRS, the same type of Form 1099 that you received, for each of the other owners showing the amount allocable to each. You must also furnish a Form 1099 to each of the other owners. You file the new Form 1099 along with Form 1096 with the Internal Revenue Service Center for your area. And on each new Form 1099, you list yourself as the payer and the other owner as the recipient. On Form 1096, list yourself as a filer. However, a husband and wife is not required to file a nominee return to show amounts owned by the other. The nominee, not the original payer, is responsible for filing the subsequent Form 1099 to show the amount allocable to each owner. So let's think about this a little. I'll go back to that client I had who got audited because he had a big independent contractor expense showing on his tax return, but he hadn't 1099 that person. This was many, many years ago. The return was prepared by someone working in our offices, and the client kind of disorganized. He's a, he's a trucker. He's a good old boy's trucker, the redneck kind of trucker who kind of, you know, lives life rather loosely. And my tax preparer worked with him was a little bit green and not too experienced in the ways of the world at that point in time. And essentially what happened was this trucker came in, had my staff member prepare his tax return, and then a year and a half later, the state of Oregon decided to audit. And it was at that point I opened it up and I saw, okay, well, this is what the state of Oregon's auditing over. And so the first thing I'm saying is, okay, did you 1099 this guy? And the trucker says, well, no. And then it was like, okay, well, explain to me what's going on here. And what was going on is he was doing a kind of a buddy system. His buddy had lost his permits to run a trucking business. I don't know if he even lost his CDL. I'm not into any of that at all. But at any rate, his buddy was actually running his own separate business through my tax client's business for the sole purpose of being able to use my client's licensing numbers. So obviously, probably not the kosher thing to have been doing, but nonetheless, it happened. So in effect, my client was receiving payment from customers and then turning that payment back over to this other trucker. That other trucker should have been reporting and filing his own return. And when it came down to it with the auditor that I was talking with, 
the auditor was saying, well, you didn't 1099, and since you didn't 1099, I want you to pay the tax on this. And I said, well, you know, we basically provided you with evidence that the money did go out and back to this other guy. So are you going to punish my client because he didn't follow the rules? I think you agree with me that he doesn't know the tax. So we finally actually went to arbitration, and in arbitration it was settled and my client didn't owe any tax at all. But it was a really good eye-opening experience to see what happens when an auditor looks at a particular line and the types of questions that they're going to be asking. So ever since then, I've, of course, been really on top of that particular issue and said, okay, if we've got big expenses going out here in any of these service-oriented descriptive categories, there needs to be 1099s going out because if there aren't, the odds of my client getting audited are fairly high. And if it's determined that they should have issued a 1099 and didn't, technically they can be fined. And in the worst case situation, maybe they're going to be asked for a whole bunch of money and that expense will be completely eliminated and not allowable at all. So there's the lesson in that experience. So when do you file a Form 1099? Well, you file the form on paper by February 28, 2013 for the 2012 tax year or by April 2nd if you are filing it electronically. If you are filing a paper return, you also need to attach Form 1096. Now, all of this information about 1099-ing and that $600 rule, I have to point out 1099-K. 1099-K is a relatively new animal. It's only been in effect for 2011, 2012, and lots of people are still confused by it. I see tax preparers who are confused by it, and certainly my tax clients are wondering what it's about. Actually, I think sometimes my tax clients have a better grasp of it than some of the tax preparers I talk to. Form 1099-K is nothing that is issued by a small business owner to anybody. Technically, they could be in a situation where they need to. I've heard some descriptions going on, say, at a farmer's market. There could be a central agency at the farmer's market who's collecting payments for all of the farmers who have booths at the market. And technically, maybe they should be giving a 1099-K to the farmers if the amount of money goes up high enough. I've heard discussions about that from the IRS at tax practitioner forums where IRS has mentioned some descriptions like that. And they're trying to sort that out and clarify it so that it's easier to understand. But in general, at the individual business owner's level, an individual business owner is not the one who issues a 1099-K. The 1099-K is issued to that business owner if that business owner accepts electronic payments through credit card machines, debit card machines, or through PayPal or Google Checkout. So essentially they're running their business either over the internet and collecting revenue in through that, or they're accepting credit cards. And if that's the case, then it is the business owner who receives a 1099-K. The business owner is never the one issuing the 1099-K. It would be like an employee issuing a W-2. Employees don't issue W-2s. They just get them. And a small business owner doesn't typically issue a 1099-K. If one is going to be issued, they're going to be getting it from the third party. So let's take a look here. Form 1099-K is a payment card and third-party network transaction. Payment settlement agents must file Form 1099-K for payments made in settlement of reportable payment transactions for each calendar year. Payment cards include Visa, MasterCard, Discover Card, etc. And third payment network payments include PayPal and Google Checkout. There are others as well, but those are the two main ones IRS provides as examples. Form 1099-K is issued to a business that accepts credit card payments or receives payments through a third party network that exceeded 20,000 in gross total reportable payment transactions and the total number of those transactions exceeded 200 for the calendar year. This is the 1099-K right here and you can see that what it provides space for is the amount of money that was run by that company either through their credit card machine or through Google Checkout or PayPal during each month. It does not provide any confidential information regarding what credit cards were charged or how much came off of each credit card that was charged. Rather, it just shows the amount that that particular third-party network provider ran on behalf of the business owner for each of these months. And the purpose of this is that at the end of the year, this document is filed with the IRS, and quite clearly, it would not be a good idea for an individual to file a tax return where the gross receipts reported on the tax return are smaller than the gross receipts shown on the 1099-K. That would be a problem. So that's one of the things that the IRS is using this form for, is to bear down and enforce more tax compliance. 
The provision that brought in this into law was enacted as part of the Tax Housing Assistance Act of 2008 and is designed to improve voluntary tax compliance by business taxpayers and to help the IRS determine whether the tax returns are correct and complete. The new law is a tool that the IRS is implementing in its efforts to close the tax gap. It also provides business taxpayers better documentation to compute and report their income and expenses. Payments made with a credit card or a payment card and certain other types of payments, including third-party network transactions, must now be reported on the form. And if you have a payment that is reported on 1099-K, that payment is not subject to reporting on Form 1099 miscellaneous. And this is one of the things that IRS at its tax practitioner forums has really gone out of its way to spend some time explaining. And that is, if you make a payment to a service provider using a credit card, the IRS does not want you to 1099 them for that payment. So let's just suppose during the year, I'll use a plumber as an example. Your business needs some plumbing work done. So you call in the plumber and he comes and he fixes a few leaks and fixes some piping and replaces the toilet in the bathroom and he gives you a bill for $1,200. And so you pull out the company credit card and you pay that plumber with the credit card. And then later in the year, you call that same plumber back and this plumber does some more work and they send you a bill for $650. And so you decide this time around, instead of using a credit card, you're gonna write them a check for $650. Well, now you're in a situation where that vendor is going to receive, or that service provider is going to receive a 1099-K that is going to indicate the first $1,200 of payment you made to them during the year. So the only amount you're going to 1099 them for is the $650 that was paid by check. Theirs does not want you to 1099 for a full $1,850 because then there would be a duplication of reporting. There would be a 1099-K showing 1200 and then the 1099 miscellaneous you issue would show that same 1200 a second time. They don't want you to do that. So what is a payment card transaction? Well, a payment card generally means a credit card, debit card, a transit card, a governmentally issued electronic benefit transaction card, or any card that is accepted as a payment by a network of persons unrelated to the issuer of the card or to any other merchants who accept payment on this card. And a payment settlement entity is a bank or organization with a contractual obligation to make payment in settlement of these transactions. So I'm going to go through and show you a series of illustrations I created a while back about when a 1099-K is and is not required. Laura Simpson runs a business which sells collector's toys on eBay. During the year, she had 190 transactions that generated $50,000 of revenue. Laura's income is greater than $20,000. However, the number of transactions is not more than 200. Therefore, her third-party network provider will not be required to issue her a 1099-K. Example number two, where a 1099-K is required. Johnny Smith operates a business which sells computers on eBay. During the year, he had 220 transactions, which generated 20,500 of revenue. Because he had more than 200 transactions and because sales were more than 20,000, his third-party network provider must issue him a 1099-K. Here's another example where a 1099-K is required. Jason Hughes is a handyman who contracts his services out to homeowners. Usually he is paid by check. However, he has a merchant visa account that allows him to accept credit card payments. During the year, he accepted three credit card payments totaling $800. Jason's third-party network provider must issue him a 1099-K because he accepted $1 or more of payments by credit card. So if we go back up, to who is required to issue a 1099-K, this page right here, it says, if you accepted payments by credit card or you received payments through a third-party network that exceeded 20,000 in gross receipts and the number of those transactions exceeded 200. So essentially, Google, Checkout, and PayPal, you're looking at more than 200 transactions totaling more than $20,000, but in terms of a credit card, one transaction is enough. Theoden, T-H-E-O-D-E-N. Theoden. Okay, and I see a question that says, if you receive a 1099, do you put it on Schedule C? Well, the answer is, you're probably supposed to. And we're going to be getting into 1099 miscellaneouses and what to do with those in a little bit. But for now, I wanted to move on to the topic of the W-9. So one of the phone calls I frequently get each tax season is a phone call from someone who says, I got this W-9 form in the mail. What am I supposed to do with it? 
And the answer is fill it out and send it in. <laughs> and if you don't fill it out and send it in, you can get in trouble because the law requires that you fill it in. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. So when should a business use a Form W-9? What's it for? Well, Form W-9 can be used to make an initial solicitation for an employer identification number. It can also be used for the annual solicitation, which I'll get to in a bit. Businesses use Form W-9 to request taxpayer identification number, TIN, of a U.S. person, including a resident alien, and to request certain certifications and claims for exemption. For federal purposes, a U.S. person includes but is not limited to an individual who is a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident alien, a partnership, corporation, company, or an association created or organized in the United States under the laws of the United States, an estate other than a foreign estate or domestic trust. A partnership may require a signed Form W-9 from its U.S. partners to overcome any presumptions of foreign status and to avoid withholding on the partner's allocable share of the partnership's effectively connected income. So let's take a look at the Form W-9. It's a fairly simple form. And when you're at the point where you're advising your client, hey, you made $3,000 of payment to an attorney last year, that means you need to get a 1099 miscellaneous out to that attorney so that you are in compliance with the reporting requirements that IRS has. And so then your tax client says to you, well, how do I do that? What kind of information do I need? And then the answer is, well, you need to get the attorney's social security number, their name, and their mailing address. And you need to know what kind of entity they are. In the case of an attorney, you have to 1099 them no matter what their entity is, but you're supposed to find that information out. And you can record that information verbally over the telephone if you like, or you could ask for it in a letter or an email and they can email it to you. That's fine. But the official way to go about getting that information is to request that the person or business that you're making payment to complete a W-9 and give it to you. So you supply the 1099 form and say, please provide me with this information. The W-9 gets all filled out. And on it, it should indicate the type of business that the entity is. Now, if you made a payment to a plumber who then tells you that he's incorporated, well, that tells you that you could 1099 miscellaneous him, but you're not required to because that entity is a corporation. So this is one of the ways that you establish what type of entity there are. And then once they've checked off their entity type, and provided you with their identification information, you would retain the W-9 form as a record to show how you acquired the information and why you did or did not issue a 1099 miscellaneous. So there's more information on the form and purposes of instructions and the purpose of the form. And essentially, the person who completes the form needs to sign it under penalties of perjury that they are telling the truth about the information they are providing. They can provide you with their social security number, or if they have an employer identification number, they can put that on there instead. But they should give you one or the other. Now, if you're working with a foreign person or making payments to a foreign person, you don't give them a W-9. Instead, you give them a W-8. Foreign persons use the appropriate form W-8, and there is more than one, and you should refer to IRS Publication 515, Withholding of Tax on Non-Resident Aliens and Foreign Entities, for more information and a list of the W-8 forms. A non-resident alien individual may, under certain circumstances, claim treaty benefits on scholarships and fellowship grant income, and that information is provided in 519. Penalties. Penalties to apply for or failure to provide a TIN when requested and for falsifying or misusing a TIN. So the law says that if a business asks you to provide your EIN or your social security number and you refuse to do so, and they made payments to you so that you're required to provide that information, then you can be fined. And the business is also, if you refuse, required to send you multiple notices explaining the law and what you need to do to bring yourself into compliance with the law. So let's talk a little bit about the penalties. Firstly, there's a failure to furnish the TIN. If you fail to furnish the correct TIN to a requester, you are subject to a penalty of $50 for each such failure, unless your failure is due to reasonable cause and not willful neglect. Now this penalty doesn't just apply in the case of completing a W-9. Another common situation where it could apply would be, let's just say, at the individual level, you're preparing a client's tax return, and they paid a child daycare provider to take care of their kids so that they could go to work. 
And now it's time to file their Form 2441 so that you can claim the child and a dependent care credit for them, except they don't have the identification number of the person they paid child care to. And that child care provider refuses to provide their number. That would be another situation where the penalty applies. False information with respect to withholding. If you make false statement with no reasonable basis that results in no backup withholding, you are subject to a $500 penalty. Falsifying information, willfully falsifying certifications or affirmations may subject you to criminal penalties including fines and or imprisonment. Misuse of TINs. If the requester discloses or uses a TIN in violation of federal law, the requester may be subject to civil and criminal penalties. So, of course, there's a number of people out there who say, I'm not going to give you my social security number. That's confidential. You can use it to steal my identity. And the IRS is saying, well, if you don't give it, you're going to be subjected to a $50 penalty. And if the person you give that information to, because you're required to under the law, misuses that information, then they can be subject to civil and criminal penalties. So the EIN is to be used only for the purpose for which it was acquired, and that would be for reporting purposes on 1099 documents. Failure to file a correct information return by the due date. If you fail to file a correct information return by the due date and you cannot show reasonable cause, you may be subject to a penalty. The amount of the penalty is based on when you file the correct information return. The penalty is $30 per information return if you correctly file within 30 days. $60 per return if you correctly file more than 30 days after the due date, but by August 1st, and $100 per return if you file after August 1st or you do not file the required information return at all. So these penalties have been on the books for quite a while. I have yet to see them imposed on any of my clients. The IRS seems to be happy that it gets the 1099 even if it gets it late, but I could see possibly that there may be some changes coming in the future as the IRS starts to hone in on this more. Exceptions for the penalty or to the penalty. You may qualify for a reduced penalty in the following situations. The penalty will not apply to any failure that you can show was due to reasonable cause and not to willful neglect. An inconsequential error or omission is not considered a failure to include correct information. An inconsequential error or omission does not prevent or hinder the IRS from processing the return from correlating information required to be shown on the return with the information shown on the payee's tax return, or from otherwise putting the return to its intended use. Errors and omissions that are never considered to be inconsequential, however, are those that relate to a TIN, a payee's surname, and any money amount. So IRS is saying if you've got an error on there that say maybe you've got the wrong address, you still filed it, but you got the TIN right, you got the last name right, and you got the money amount right, but maybe the address is wrong. Well, the address being wrong would be inconsequential because it doesn't prevent the IRS from identifying the payee and how much was paid to them. But if you have the other information wrong, any of these three items, then that would be considered to be a consequential error. There's also a de minimis rule for corrections. Even though you cannot show reasonable cause, the penalty for failure to file correct information returns will not apply to a certain number of returns if you file those information returns and either failed to include all of the information required on a return or included incorrect information, and then you realize the error of your ways and filed a correction by August 1st. Intentional disregard of the filing requirements. If any failure to file a correct information return is due to intentional disregard of the filing or correct information requirements, the penalty is at least $250 per information return with no maximum penalty. Now, this penalty by itself, $250, may or may not seem to you to be substantial. But if you've got a business that in multiple situations should have been issuing 1099s and hasn't been doing so, say for three years, maybe they have enough business going on out there in the realm of what they're doing that they should have issued 10 1099s a year. And for three years that the IRS is looking at them, they've never done it. Well, 10 times $250 would be $2,500 a year, and if you have that by three years, now you're up to $7,500 or so in fines, and these numbers can add up pretty quickly. They can also apply to failure to issue W-2s correctly. I've even seen a client fined because she passed over this threshold amount where if you file more than 250 information returns in a year and you fail to do so electronically, you can be fined for each individual information return that was not filed electronically and should have been. And essentially, this had to do with W-2s. She's always been under 250. She went over 250, didn't realize that there was now an e-file requirement. She got a penalty notice for something like $20,000 because she did an e-file, a form that the IRS says needs to be e-filed. So those small little numbers can be adding up pretty quickly and therefore 
they should be of concern to you, even though they don't seem very large on the surface. Failure to furnish correct payee statements. If you fail to provide correct payee statements and you cannot show a reasonable cause, you may be subjected to a penalty. The penalty applies if you fail to provide the statement by January 31st. You fail to include all information required to be shown on the statement, or you include incorrect information on the statement. The amount of the penalty is based on when you furnish the correct payee statement. It is a separate penalty, and it is applied in the same manner as the penalty for failure to file the correct information returned by the due date. So right there, we're already seeing that the penalty would apply once for not filing it with the IRS and another time for not providing it to the payee. It's already double what we thought it was. Intentional disregard of payee statement requirements. If any failure to provide a correct payee statement is due to intentional disregard of the requirements to furnish a correct payee statement, the penalty is at least $250 per payee statement with no maximum amount. All right, now we're on to these CP2100 letters. I've had more than one client call me saying that they've received these notices in the mail and what's it about? Well, a CP21 notice comes when you, as a business owner, file a 1099 document with the IRS, and that 1099 document has invalid matching on it. In other words, the IRS is looking to see the identification of the person that you issued that 1099 to, and they cannot identify that person. They're able to identify that you've provided inaccurate information, in other words. So it's going to come back to the business owner, and the IRS is going to say, the 1099 you filed with us contains invalid information, and because it contains invalid information, you must take action. So that's what we're on to next. Payers are required to file Form 1099 documents, or who are required, must provide the correct TIN and name of the payee. If the payer submits a 1099 document with a missing or incorrect or mismatched TIN, the IRS will issue the payer a CP2100 notice to notify the payer that he or she may be responsible for backup withholding. The notice is accompanied by a listing of missing, incorrect, and or not currently issued payee TINs. And whether you'll receive a CP2100A notice or a CP2100 notice just depends on how many incorrect documents you issued. Most small businesses are just going to be receiving a CP2100A notice, but if you're a very large filer who had over 250 error documents, then you could receive a CD in the mail instead. What should I do if I receive a CP2100 notice? The notice will state which names and or numbers are either a mismatch or missing. Compare the names and the numbers listed on the notices with your records. For missing TINs, if you have not started a backup withholding, you need to begin to do so immediately, and you need to continue withholding until you receive a TIN. You must make up to three solicitations for the TIN, the initial, the first annual, and the second annual, to avoid a penalty for failing to include a TIN on the information return. So what this is saying, you've got a small business owner. They've made payments during the year of $2,000 to an attorney. They're required to issue that attorney a 1099 miscellaneous. And so they talk to the attorney over the phone, and they get the attorney's name, address, and social security number, and they put it on the 1099 miscellaneous document. They issue a copy to the attorney. They send in the required document to the IRS. And a few months later, they get a CP2100A notice from the IRS saying, hey, there was a mismatch. At that point, the business owner is required to take action. The action is that they need to send a B notice out to the attorney saying, hey, the information you gave us is invalid and incorrect, and you need to provide us with the correct information. And it has to be in a particular written format, delivered in a certain way, and the IRS wants the business owner to keep record of that. This first initial solicitation, is it called? You should be asking, in all frankness, for the EIN or the Social Security number of the payee at the time you're making the payment or before you even make the payment. And you shouldn't be waiting until months later when it's time to actually issue the 1099 documents. So that's the first thing. When you're educating your clients about actions they need to be taking on a regular daily basis, that would include reporting requirements and meeting them. And if you've got a business owner who is your tax client and they come to you and you're working on their tax return and you see that they did not issue any 1099 miscellaneouses during the year, not only should you be taking steps to help them get those 1099 miscellaneouses issued for the prior year as they should be done, but you should also be having a discussion with them, hey, for the future, do not issue any more checks or money to people who provide you services without having them complete a W-9 first. Because here's the deal. Once you've made a payment to a particular individual or business, 
the odds of them later on wanting to provide you with their EIN or their social security number is much smaller. You've got no leverage. You've already given them their money, so they might want to just take it and run and not give you that information. So you avoid that by making sure you get the information before you ever pay them. Now, if you're in a situation where you've asked them to complete a W-9 and they've refused to, the way out of the problem is to pay them with your credit card if they accept credit card payments. But if they refuse to complete a W-9 and provide you with their information, the law does require that you take specific action. And the action that you are required to take is called backup withholding. Backup withholding is 28% withholding. So let's just suppose you've got an attorney you've been working with and you're about to write him a check for $2,000. And you say to that attorney, okay, now I need you to complete a W-9 so that I can make payment to you. And the attorney says, I'm not filling out a W-9. I'm not going to give you my information. So you say, okay, well, your refusal to provide me with your number means that I have to do backup withholding. And the backup withholding is 28% of the $2,000. That would be $560 of backup withholding. So I'm going to write you a check for $2,000 minus $560. So that would be $1,440, right, that they're going to get a check for instead of $2,000. Well, when the attorney hears that, he might say, I think I'll fill out that form. <laughs> for an attorney would be a, not a good example of someone who would be fussing over this rule. They have ethics requirements, and that would not be normally the person who would refuse to provide the information. It was just something I randomly picked. But you can see in a situation like that that before you write the check to that person is the time that you need to be asking for that information. And kind of just as a silly tidbit here over on my side of the world, I actually had to threaten my landlord with backup withholding in order to get him to fill out a W-9 one year. He didn't want to fill it out so that we could 1099 him for the rent that our business pays him. And so I finally gave the threat of backup withholding, and he had a tirade, but he filled it out. So <laughs> that is what the law requires. It's not even something that is my choice. The business owner knows that they need to do it, and the business owner needs to follow through with application of the law in that regard. All right, so let's go and talk about these initial solicitations, the first annual solicitation, and so forth. So an initial solicitation is when you make the first request that payee has either opened their account with you or you've basically signed an agreement to do business with them. At that point in time, that's when you're supposed to make the initial request. And if they say no at that time, you should begin backup withholding immediately. You should never even give them a single payment because they've made a refusal, and that refusal requires backup withholding. Okay, so let's just suppose you didn't know that you were supposed to make an initial request. You didn't do it, and now you need it. So now you're going to make an annual solicitation. If the payee does not provide the TIN after you make that first initial solicitation, and it could happen that you don't know to ask for it until after you've paid them, then you're supposed to send them this first annual solicitation. You must make the first annual solicitation by December 31st of the year in which the account is opened for accounts that were opened before December, or January 31st of the following year for accounts that were opened during the preceding December. Second annual solicitation, if the payee did not provide a TIN after the first annual solicitation, you must make the second annual solicitation by December 31 of the year following the calendar year in which the account was opened. I do see a question here. If a business has to do backup withholding, what do you do with those funds if you don't have a TIN? Well, that's a very good question because, you know, the, the person that you do backup withholding on, they can get credit for their backup withholding on their tax return, but they're going to have to be able to prove to the IRS that they had backup withholding, and since no EIN or Social Security number was attached to the 1099 miscellaneous, that would be rather hard. But what would essentially happen is the business owner does the backup withholding, and the business owner is going to need to send that payment to the IRS in the usual way that, that withholding payments are made to the IRS. There's information returns that are filed, and you can use the electronic federal tax payment system to do it, EFTPS. You can make those payments. And so once, as a business owner, you've taken control of that money, you have to make the payment out to the government. You are acting in a trustee capacity, and it has to go out. So the money goes out, and now it's time to fill out the 1099. So you fill out the 1099 with what information you have. You have their name, you have the address that you know, and you have the amount that you paid them, and then there's space on the form to also enter any backup withholding you did. And then at that point, it's in their court. You know, they have to figure out how they're going to get their money back from the government, which obviously would entail filing a return, reporting the income, and ultimately providing the Social Security number or the EIN that they refuse to give. So the first annual solicitation, how does that look or what happens when you make an annual solicitation requirement? A solicitation is a request for the payee's correct TIN. 
You must make the request to satisfy the backup withholding requirements and to avoid a penalty for filing another information return with a missing or incorrect TIN. For Form 1099 miscellaneous and 1099-K payments, the payee may furnish or provide the TIN in any manner. With respect to payments of interest, dividends, and amounts subject to broker reporting, the payee must furnish a certified TIN on a Form W-9. And this second category that we're looking at right here is essentially you're going into a financial institution and you're opening up a bank account. And at that time, in these modern times, when you open up a bank account, they're probably going to be asking you to complete a TIN because the law requires that they identify who you are for purposes of opening that account. But with respect to businesses who are making payments out on 1099s, miscellaneous, for example, the information can be provided in any fashion. It does not have to be on a W-9. For incorrect TINs, you must make up to two annual solicitations called the B notices to a payee in response to receipt of a CP2100 notice. You must begin to back up withhold on all reportable payments to the payee 30 business days after you have received a CP2100 notice. You must stop backup withholding on payments within 30 calendar days after you received the required certification on a Form W-9 from the payee or TIN validation from the Social Security Administration or the IRS if it was a second notification. At your option, you may start and stop backup withholding at any time during these 30-day periods. So what this is saying is, okay, I properly asked my client to give me a Form W-9 and they gave me one. And that's the information that I provided to IRS when I filed the 1099 miscellaneous. Now I've got a CP2100 notice that's telling me that the information I put on there is wrong. So I've got a W9, I compare it to the CP21 notice. The first thing I would look at is, did I get it right? Is the information on the W9 what I sent to the IRS? Because if it's different, then it would be my fault. I had a transposition error, I spelled the name wrong, I got the EIN number wrong. Maybe I should just correct that and let the IRS know that there was an error. That would be one way of handling it. But if I look at the CP2100 notice and I see, okay, the information they say I provided is in fact the same information that's on this form, now I need to start backup withholding and I'm going to need to make another solicitation to that client. I'm going to need to make the additional solicitation and I'm also going to have to start the backup withholding on any future payments that I make. Time for allowed to send the B notices. You must send the first B notice and a Form W-9 to the payee within 15 business days after you receive the CP2100 notice. If you receive a proposed penalty notice, but not a CP2100 notice, your annual solicitation must be made by December 31st of the year you received the proposed penalty notice. So what has to be in the first notice? If this is the first CP2100 notice that you have received with respect to this account, you must provide the payee with the first B notice and a copy of Form W-9. Well, what's a B notice? <laughs> a B notice is essentially a letter saying you've been noticed. <laughs> the IRS has noticed that you don't have the correct information or I didn't provide them with the correct information. And it's essentially just a letter that the business owner types. So the B notice is a letter typed by the business owner explaining that there was a mismatch or that the information was not provided as it should have been. And then also in that letter that you send to that individual, you would attach a copy of the W-9. And if you like, you can provide an envelope in which they fill out the 1099 and mail it all back to you. The outside, however, of the envelope that you mail to the individual who is required to fill out the W-9 form must have important tax documentation enclosed or important tax return document enclosed clearly written on the envelope. So we're on the first D notice, has to say important tax document written on the front. You send that off and nothing comes back. Or perhaps even you get the envelope back and they've never opened it. If that's the case, the IRS wants you to retain a copy. You need to retain a copy of the fact with the envelope that's cleared through the post office and showed that it's been returned to sender just as proof that you, in fact, did make an effort to issue that B notice. And even subsequent to that effort on the first solicitation, you need to send out another solicitation. Whether the first was returned or not, you do need to send out a second solicitation if the first solicitation did not get you the EIN that you had requested. And obviously, after the first solicitation, you're doing backup withholding if you're still doing business with this business, and certainly at the second solicitation, you've completed your legal requirements and you just maintain proof that you've done that. 
So backup withholding, I did mention that already. Entities required to report payments made on Form 1099 or W-2 must perform backup withholding if the payee fails to furnish a correct TIN. Section 3406A1 requires certain payors to perform backup withholding by deducting and withholding income tax from a reportable payment if the payee fails to furnish the payee's taxpayer identification number to the payer on a return or if the IRS notifies the payor that the TIN furnished by the payee is incorrect. Now, here's the deal with backup withholding. If you're required to do backup withholding and you don't do it, the IRS can t say that you're responsible for the money you didn't hold out, and you're going to have to pay it anyway. So backup withholding is not like, well, I'm just not going to bother. I'm going to do this guy a favor. I don't want to hurt him. He hasn't given me a TIN, and, you know, let the IRS deal with it. <laughs> well, technically speaking, the IRS can deal with it by making you pay the backup withholding that you were supposed to withhold and did not. So it's something you want to be on top of. Payments that are subject to backup withholding include interest payments, dividends, patronage dividends, rents, profits, or other gains, commissions, fees, or other payments for work you do as an independent contractor or that someone who is an independent contractor did for you if you're the one doing the backup withholding, royalty payments, and certain other payments. Backup withholding may also apply to gambling winnings unless subject to regular gambling withholding. What are the withholding rules? Well, when you open an account, make an investment, or begin to receive payments reported on a Form 1099, the bank or other business will give you a Form W-9 or a similar form. You must enter your TIN on the form, and if your account or investment will earn interest or dividends, you must also certify that your TIN is correct and that you are not subject to backup withholding. The payer must withhold at a flat rate of 28% in the following situations. You did not give the payer your TIN in the required manner. The IRS notifies the payer that the TIN you gave is incorrect. You required but failed to certify that you were not subject to backup withholding, or the IRS notifies the payer to start withholding on interest or dividends because you have underreported interest or dividends on your income tax return. But the IRS will only do that after it has mailed you four notices over a period of at least 210 days. How to prevent or stop backup withholding. If you have been notified by a payer that the TIN you gave is incorrect, you usually can prevent backup withholding from starting or stop backup withholding once it has begun by giving the payer your correct TIN and name. You must certify that the TIN you give is correct. If you have been notified that you underreported interest or dividends, you must request and receive a determination from the IRS to prevent backup withholding from starting or to stop backup withholding once it has begun again. One of the things I do know that when we're dealing with 1099 miscellaneous is there's 30 days to stop withholding and 30 days to start withholding that the payor has. But when it comes to those 1099 dividends and INTs, it can be, I believe, until a full year has passed. They have different limits on that. Don't quote me on the time lengths, but I know that it's not the same 30-day rule. Verification of TINs. It is possible for a business to verify the correctness of a TIN through the taxpayer identification number matching system. By using the matching program, a business can verify a payee's TIN and thereby avoid the possibility of filing or reporting document with incorrect information. How does the IRS matching process work? Well, it's very similar to what happens when we electronically file a client's return. If you've been in tax returns for any length of time at all, you must understand what happens when a tax return is e-filed. The tax return, of course, has the Social Security number and the name of the filer. And when you transmit a tax return electronically, the IRS actually looks to the name of the filer shown on the return and the Social Security number on the return, and it matches those against the database that it has from Social Security. And if there's a mismatch, that tax return is rejected. And the electronic matching system that we have for W-2s and 1099s is a very similar system, except it's outside of the filing of the return. Filing of a tax return is done through IRS e-file, and if there is a mismatch, there's a reject there. But at the 1099 level, the rejects usually happen weeks or months later that you get the notices. But the TIN matching system that is available would allow you to instantaneously know whether or not you have a match before you ever file information returns. And the system is quite popular with larger employers. I happened to notice a few weeks ago when I was standing in Costco at the return counter there was a sign up there that said that Costco uses this system for all job hires. So if you're filling out an application and you want to work for Costco, they're going to run your 
information through this particular system to make sure that the name and the social security number you have given them is valid. So the IRS matching process, businesses that are required to file Forms 1099 or W-2 must include a correct name or TIN combination to allow the IRS to match the information reported by the payer against the income included on the payee's income tax return. The IRS checks to see whether a name or TIN combination is correct by matching it against files that contain Social Security numbers issued by the Social Security Administration or EIN numbers issued by the IRS. Depending on whether the name or TIN combination is for an individual or business, the IRS will utilize the following methods to verify if there is a match between the name and the TIN provided on the tax return or income reporting document that is filed. So I've got quite a bit of information coming up on the next few pages that is about the IRS matching process, and I'm not going to read it to you, but I'm going to point out some of the important information. Some of this is not new information. The IRS has used this exact system all 21 tax seasons I've been in the business. They haven't changed it in all the years I've been in business, and I'm sure they had it in place long before I came into the business. So the name control match, the IRS always looks at the first four letters of the last name. This filer's name is Ralph Teak. IRS really couldn't care less that his first name is Ralph. When it comes to matching, they're going to look at Teak, T-E-A-K, and they're going to match Teak against the Social Security number that you've put on that W-2 or that 1099. And if there's a mismatch, that's going to cause a reject or a notice to come to you. In the case of a filer named Dorothy Willow, Willow is obviously more than four letters in the last name, and so it's going to go with the first four letters of the last name, W-I-L-L. -L. And in the case of Joe McCedar, it would start with M-C and then go C-E. And in a hyphenated name, the IRS will always be looking to the first four letters of the first name in the hyphenated name. Now, when we get into sole proprietors who have DBAs, we're still looking at the first four letters of the proprietor's last name, regardless of what DBA they're working under. So Mark Hemlock doing business as the Sunshine Cafe, the DBA would not be what the IRS is comparing. They would be comparing H-E-M-L. When we get into estates, they're looking for what looks to be the last name of the person's name who is in the name of the estate. And for example, if the name of the estate is the Frank White Estate, IRS would be matching against W-H-I-T. When we get into trusts and fiduciaries, they're looking again for the last name. They're trying to find a last name in the name somewhere. And when they identify what they think is the last name, they use the first four letters of that name. So you can imagine, you know, you might have some people that have three or four names. John Hinkle Weidler Smith is a name. And Smith would appear to be the last name, but if it was hyphenated, Weidler Smith, then the first four letters of Weidler would be the letters that are being matched. So you do need to be looking for hyphenation, and it is possible that what you think is the first four letters of the last name is not the last name that the IRS has identified, even though you may have the correct last name. How you're entering it in the fields could be a mismatch because you've put a middle name as far as the IRS is concerned, or you've put what you think is the last name, but the IRS does not think that's the last name. Here we have a name that does not involve the name of an individual. The Memory Church Endowment Trust, and here they've gone with M-E-M-O. Partnerships. We throw out the word the at the front and go to the name of the partnership, A-O-A-K space tree. So it's got a T. And other organizations. So this is essentially just a guide to help you understand how it is that IRS chooses a name control match. And to summarize, if there is a mismatch and you're using a, some form of electronic confirmation system, the IRS will tell you that there's a mismatch. They won't typically tell you what the correct information is. They'll just tell you that your information is wrong. And so you're going to have to go back to the person who gave you that information and say, hey, the information you gave me is a mismatch. Let's figure out why. It could be that they gave you the information incorrectly. It could be that you entered it incorrectly. Or it could be that, you know, in the case of a spouse, maybe a woman got married and she's put down the first four letters of her new married name but she's never changed her name with Social Security, and so as far as IRS is concerned, she's still got her maiden name. So people who marry and then get divorced, if there's name changes going on there, those name changes actually have to be filed with the Social Security Administration, and if they're not, then the IRS is not aware of the name change and can't match to it. On to Form 1099 Miscellaneous. A small business owner may be both a recipient and an issuer of Form 1099 Miscellaneous. If your business provides services to another business, that business may issue you a Form 1099 miscellaneous to report payments that it made to you. 
And in turn, you may also be required to issue a Form 1099 miscellaneous to that other business or to the independent contractors that provide services to you. Depending on which type of income is reported, you will need to report 1099 miscellaneous income as rental, royalty, self-employment, or Form 1040 Line 21 income. You should never, however, report 1099 miscellaneous income as Line 7 wages on a tax return unless you can show that the 1099 miscellaneous was issued in error and all of the following are true. So what I'm saying by this is let's just suppose you have a client sitting with you to do their tax return and they show you that they've received a 1099 miscellaneous. And they've got a number in box 7 right down here. It says non-employee compensation. Well, there should be an instant recognition on your part that as far as the IRS is concerned, box 7, non-employee compensation, belongs on Schedule C. And if you've got a tax client who's bringing you a 1099 miscellaneous with box 7 having a number in it, you need to do a Schedule C. But there are situations which I've run across regularly over time, where the person who has received this 1099 saying, yeah, I don't know why my employer gave me that. They've always given me a W-2 in the past. I don't know why this particular company that I'm working for now gave me this 1099 miscellaneous. I don't understand any of it. Well, as a tax practitioner, I certainly understand all of it, and I see that it's probably wrong. And why would the employer issue a 1099 miscellaneous when they should be issuing a W-2? Well, the first reason is they are trying to escape paying their share of employer payroll taxes and doing the withholdings and file the 940 and 941s that they're supposed to. They're probably supposed to be carrying workers' compensation, and they're not. They're probably supposed to be doing a lot of things that they're not, and this 1099 is just kind of the first point telling me that they're doing it wrong. So if I see a situation where I think a W-2 should have been issued, but a 1099 was issued instead, can I then put it on the line 7 as wages, or do I still have to do a Schedule C? Well, the dilemma is that the IRS says you can take it and put it on line 7 as wages only if you follow protocol. And protocol is that you can show that you were, in fact, an employee, and that you will need to then attach a substitute W-2 year return. You're going to have to attach a Form 8919 to your tax return to basically dispute the allocation of how that income is being reported, and you're also going to have to file Form SS-8 to ask the IRS to establish the employee relationship. Unfortunately, I've never had a client willing to go through all of these procedures in order to take a number shown in Box 7 so that they can put it on line 7 of their tax return. In nearly every case, they've said, I'd just rather pay the tax and not deal with all of that, and so that's what we do. Now, do I have to do a Schedule C when they weren't in business for themselves? The answer is, well... If they weren't in business for themselves, technically I don't think you should be filing a business tax return. But if you have to report it on the return, and if you don't report it on the return, the IRS is going to send a CP2000 letter to your client. So in these situations, one of the things I have done is entered the income directly on line 21 and then assess self-employment tax on the amount shown on the form. But that's still not technically the correct way to do it. And just sometimes... As a tax practitioner, we're just left with we can't do what we want. We can't do all of the right things because our client is not willing to go through the procedures up top here. They're not willing to do all five of these things in order to allow us to report it where we think it belongs. So we're basically dealing with a situation where, well, it's got to be on the return. Here's what we're going to do. Now, looking at this 1099, we've got a box one for rents and a box two for royalties. If you received real estate rental income, you may receive a Form 1099 miscellaneous with Box 1 income. And if you do, then that means that you are a landlord receiving rents and you need to report that income on Schedule E. However, if you provided significant service to your tenant, sold real estate as a business, or rented personal property as a business, or you and your spouse elected to be treated as a qualified joint venture, you should report this on Schedule C or CEZ instead. The next line on the document is line 3, and we're essentially going through these lines one at a time. When you get to line 3, this is the other income box. And generally, you report other income on line 21 of the Form 1040, and you identify what the payment is that was reported in the box. Form 1099 Miscellaneous Box 3, Other Income, is most commonly used to report prize winnings and other miscellaneous forms of income. However, if you receive payment in the course of your trade or business, you should report other income on Schedule C or CEZ. Federal income tax withheld. This shows backup withholding or withholding on gaming profits. Generally, a payer must backup withhold at a rate of 28% if you did not furnish your Social Security or your EIN to the payer. You report this amount on your income tax return as withheld. 
Box 5 is for fishing boat proceeds, and those get reported on Schedule C. Box 6 is for medical and health care payments. I do occasionally see that. That gets reported on Schedule C. The situations where I've seen clients get medical and health care payments reported in Box 6 is when they're volunteering basically their bodies as guinea pigs for research being done by hospitals. That's where I've seen it. They're going out to the hospital once a month or once a week for a period of time, and they're getting procedures done on them to test some new drug or some new procedure, and they're getting paid for that. And that is an item that IRS says goes on Schedule C. Non-employee compensation. This is the box that I usually see has a number in it. If my client comes in with a 1099 miscellaneous, box 7 is the one usually filled in. If you have box 7 income, you are considered to have self-employment income. If you have self-employment expenses, you must file Schedule C, EZ, or F to claim these expenses, or the IRS will tax you on the full amount of payment you received. If you receive a 1099 miscellaneous and you do not consider yourself to be self-employed, then you should request that your employer issue you a Form W-2 instead. And if your employer refuses to issue a Form W-2, you should consult with the IRS or a tax specialist for advice on how to report the income. And the advice is you're going to have to go through all of those procedures I just mentioned above. Box 8, substitute payments in lieu of interest or dividend. And Box 9 is the payer made direct sales of $5,000 or more. If checked, $5,000 or more of consumer products was paid to you on a buy, sell, deposit, commission, or other basis. A dollar amount does not have to be shown. Generally report any income from your sale of these products on Schedule C. Box 10 is used for crop insurance proceeds, and Box 14 shows gross proceeds paid to an attorney in connection with legal services. Okay, so we're on to the next topic of the day, which is reporting income. And we're going to start with line one of the Schedule C. So if you can believe it, we've been talking for two hours and we didn't even get to line one. <laughs> so we still have a lot of, to cover in today's class, uh, starting with line one. You must report on your tax return all income that you receive from your business unless it is excluded by law. In most cases, your business income will be in the form of cash, check, and credit card charges. And here we have line one, gross receipts or sales. See the instruction for line one. And if you go to the instructions for line one, you essentially get income items like this that need to be reported on line one. Business income can come from forms other than cash, such as property or services. And if you get these kind of property or services, they still need to be reported as income. Bartering for property or services, canceled debt, restricted property, gains and losses, promissory notes, lost income payments, and damages. Items, however, that are not income include appreciation in the value of your property, construction allowances you receive from your landlord, loans that you take out, or sales tax that you are required to collect and then turn over to a state or local government. Income reported on Form W-2 for statutory employees. It's possible that you would be filling out Schedule C and making an entry on Line 1 and then entering expenses on the rest of the Schedule C because your client has a W-2, which has the statutory employee box checked. If you received a Form W-2 and the statutory employee box is checked, in Box 13 of that particular form, report your income that is reported on Form W-2 with the statutory employee box checked on Line 1 of Schedule C, and then check the box that's on Line 1 of Schedule C. So let's just go back up to that line so you can see what I'm talking about. It says right here, if income was reported to you on Form W-2 and the statutory employee box was checked on that form, check this box. And that tells the IRS that the income reported on Line 1 is not income that's going to be subject to self-employment tax, but you are still supposed to report it on the Schedule C. Returns and allowances, we've got Line 2 right here. Subtract the cost of returns and allowances you made to your customer from gross receipts of your business on this line. Returns and allowances include cash or credit card refunds that you make to customers, rebates and other allowances off the actual sales price. And then on line three, you basically take line one, you subtract out the returns and allowances from line two, and you have the entry for line three. Now if you have cost of goods sold, um, you also need to complete part three of Schedule C and then carry over to line four, the amount from line 42 of Schedule C. And we'll talk about cost of goods sold in a little bit. Number five is gross profit. That's gross receipts from your business minus cost of goods sold. And on line six, we have other income. On line six, you report amounts that you received from finance reserve income, scrap sales, bad debts that you recovered, interest, 
state gasoline or fuel tax refunds you received in 2012, credit for biodiesel and renewable diesel fuels claimed on line 8 of 8864, the credit for alcohol and cellulosic biofuel fuels, credit for federal tax paid on fuels claimed on your 2011 return, prizes and awards related to your trade or business, recapture of accelerated depreciation and Section 179 deduction, and other kinds of miscellaneous business income include amounts received in your trader business as shown on Form 1099-PATR. But if your business received interest income, odds are it does not get reported on Line 6. There are situations where it does get reported on Line 6. How you report interest income depends on the type of interest income you have received. If you have received interest on a notes receivable that you have accepted in the ordinary course of your trader business, you do report that as business income on line six. So let's just suppose your business is to provide catering services. You've done some catering work for a particular company and now you've billed them. And on the bill you're saying, if you don't pay by this date, we're gonna assess you interest and the date passes and they finally pay you and now you send them another bill for interest because they paid late, that additional interest you received in is income to your business and does get reported on line six. Interest received on loans is business income if you are in the business of lending money only. Interest income you earn from a business bank account holding is not reported on Schedule C. You report this kind of interest income on Form 1040, line eight. That's where you enter interest income. Recapture of depreciation is another item that gets entered on line six. You may be required to include certain previously deducted depreciation items in your income. For listed property, if your business use of listed property falls to 50% or less in a tax year, and you previously claimed a Section 179 deduction in an earlier year for that asset, you're going to have to do a recapture of depreciation. And the amount of depreciation that you recapture is entered on Schedule C, line six and you would figure the recapture using Form 4797. So let's take a look here at an example of how that would work. In 2011, Max purchased and placed in service a computer in his business at a cost of $2,000. He claimed a Section 179 deduction for the full purchase price on his 2011 Schedule C. Then in 2012, Max's business use of the computer dropped from 100% down to only 40%. So here's how things looked. He claimed a $2,000 deduction under Section 179 on his 2011 return. The 2011 depreciation deduction, if he had calculated that straight line, would have only been $200. And the difference between the amount claimed straight line and the amount that he claimed as a Section 179 deduction is $1,800. He will need to report that $1,800 as income on line 6 of his Schedule C. You can see what I've got here is Part 4 of Form 4797 filled out, and that's where this calculation goes on. Moving on down the Schedule C, we finally get to Line 7, which is where we add up Lines 5 and 6. And on that, we're going to show our gross receipts, minus our cost of goods sold, plus adding in other income. And we finally got a net income for our business on Line 7. And now we're moving on with reporting expenses. I see a question coming in here. If you receive a W-2 because you work a regular job and you also own a business, does that W-2 income go on line one too? Absolutely not. Your regular job where you receive a regular W-2 has nothing to do with a Schedule C business. If you have a W-2 that shows that the statutory employee box is checked, then that one W-2 that has the statutory employee box checked would carry over to Schedule C. If you have a situation where the statutory box is not checked, then that would never go to Schedule C. A statutory employee is a person typically who is a salesperson, but it also includes some delivery drivers and some home workers who sell clothes and so forth, and they're paid on a piece basis. And essentially, the IRS is saying, or that category of worker is under the statute treated as an employee, and so the employer has to do Social Security and Medicare tax withholding on them. But in every other respect, they're really running their own business and acting independently as independent businesses. And so in those situations, they're issued a W-2 and the statutory employee box is checked. But you don't just uh, say, oh, well, you got a W-2 and you got a business. Let's put it all on the business. It, no, absolutely not. Reporting expenses. Part two of Schedule C provides lines for a variety of expense items. We're going to be taking each of these lines in turn. You do eventually get to line 27, where it says other expenses from line 48. So let's start with line 8, advertising. 
So line eight is as it seems. It says advertising. It is as it sounds. If it's advertising, it belongs on this line. And examples would include yellow page, radio, telephone, television, direct mail, and other promotional costs of your business. That's what goes on line eight. Pretty self-explanatory. Line nine, I have a little bit more to say. Because on line nine, you're entering your car at truck expenses. And when it comes to car and truck expenses, there's a lot of rules that need to be applied before you just whack a number on that line. Not the least of which is that you're going to either have to complete part four of Schedule C or part five of Form 4562 to provide all of the required information on the business use of the vehicle. You can deduct the actual expenses of operating your car or truck, or you can take the standard mileage allowance. And this is true these days after a recent change even if you use your car for hire, such as a taxi cab. Previously, there was a rule that said taxi drivers couldn't claim the standard mileage allowance, but that rule is now gone, and they too can use it. You must use actual expenses if you used five or more cars simultaneously in your business, and this is called a fleet operation when you have five or more. You cannot use actual expenses for a leased vehicle if you previously used the standard mileage rate for that vehicle. You can take the standard mileage rate for 2012 only if you owned the vehicle and used the standard mileage rate for the first year you placed that vehicle in service or you lease the vehicle and or you are using the standard mileage rate for the entire lease period. Auto expense reporting requirements. If you claim auto expenses on any car or truck, you must provide information by completing one of the following. Schedule C, Part 4, or from 4562, Part 5. Local transportation. Local transportation expenses are not travel expenses. However, certain local transportation costs are deductible. Local transportation costs include the ordinary and necessary costs of the following. Getting from one workplace to another workplace in the course of your business or profession when you are traveling within your tax home. Visiting clients or customers. Going to a business meeting away from your regular workplace. Getting from your home to a temporary workplace when you have one or more regular places of work. These temporary workplaces can be either within the area of your tax home or outside of that area. But there is a cautionary note here. Local business transportation does not include expenses you have while traveling away from home overnight on business. If you have transportation expenses for traveling away from home overnight on business, those would be travel expenses. Temporary work location lasting one year or less. If you are assigned a temporary work location in the local area of your tax home, you may be able to deduct transportation expenses subject to the following. Number one, if you have a regular job location and you commute to a temporary work location in the same trade or business, you can deduct the expenses of the daily round trip distance between your home and the temporary location. If you have no regular place of work, but ordinarily work in the metropolitan area where you live, you can deduct daily transportation costs between home and a temporary job site outside of that metropolitan area only. Commute costs are the cost of driving to and from work within your metropolitan area, and commute costs are never deductible. The following transportation is considered to be commute. Driving to a temporary job site when you do not have a regular job location. If you do not have a regular job location, you cannot deduct daily transportation costs between your home and a temporary work site within your metropolitan area. These are considered to be non-deductible commuting expenses. If you drive from home to a second job, you also cannot deduct that to travel either. You essentially need to have two places of work. The following rules apply if you work at two or more places in the same day. You can deduct the expense of getting from one workplace to the other, and if, for personal reasons, you cannot go directly from one work location to the next, such as a detour to visit your doctor along the way to your second job, you can only claim expenses equivalent to what it would have cost you to travel directly if you had done so. And so the IRS has this table. It comes out of Publication 17, page 184. And if you look at the table, it really explains everything I just finished telling you very nicely in a graphic image. Firstly, we have your house. IRS is saying anytime you ever drive from home to your regular main job, that is a non-deductible commute expense. And anytime you travel from your main home to a second job, that too is a non-deductible work expense. But if you travel from your home to a temporary location and you also have a regular job location, then the distance between from your home and that temporary location is deductible. 
If you travel from your regular job to a temporary work site or from your regular job to a second job, that is deductible. And if you drive from a temporary work location to a second job, that also is deductible. And here we have a little chart. It shows deductible transportation costs on the left side and non-deductible transportation costs on the right side. Let's look at what is deductible first. Commuting from one job to another job in the same day. Fees for parking while attending a meeting away from your normal work location. You can claim the cost of putting an ad on your car. And you can claim the cost of operating a for-profit carpool, which you operate as a business. Added costs you pay because you haul tools or instruments to work is also deductible. Non-deductible side of things, though, you can never deduct the cost of commuting to and from your job, or fees for parking while you are at work, or having to advertising displays on your car. Do not create a business use for the vehicle, which must still be tracked separately. Also, you cannot claim the cost of your share of carpool expenses you pay to travel to and from work. The fact that you haul tools or instruments to and from work does not mean that you are using your car for business purposes. So if you have tools in your car and you drive them from home to work and it's a regular work day inside your metropolitan area, you're not going to be allowed that expense even though you're hauling your tools because the theory is you'd be going there anyway. And also, finally, the IRS has specifically pointed out that union member trips to a union hall are non-deductible expenses. For parking, fees you pay to park your car at your place of business are non-deductible commute expenses. You can deduct the cost of a business-related parking expense only when you visit a client or customer or you attend a meeting away from your normal work location. Allowable auto. If you use your car for business, you can claim the actual cost of operating your car or you may be able to claim a standard mileage. Whichever method you choose, you must keep adequate records to prove your business use. For 2012, the standard mileage rate is 55 and a half cents per mile, and it's going up or is at 56.5 for 2013. Choosing to claim the standard mileage rate. Well, you might think it's just as simple as saying, hey, I'm going to claim the standard mileage rate this year. That's the easiest way to do it. Certainly, I prefer the standard mileage rate. It gives a very generous deduction. It's easy to figure. A lot less work to figure than tracking your actual expenses and adding up the receipt. But there's some rules about who, when, where, and why you can use the standard mileage rate, and that's what we're going to be talking about now. And these rules that I'm about to read you come straight out of publication 463, page 16. If you want to use the standard mileage rate for a car you own, you must choose to use it in the first year that the car is available for use in your business. Then in later years, you can choose to use either the standard mileage rate or the actual expenses. You must make the choice to use the standard mileage rate by the due date, including extensions of your tax return. You cannot revoke the choice. However, in later years, you can switch from the standard mileage rate to the actual expense method. If you change to the actual expense method in a later year, but before your car is fully depreciated, you have to estimate the remaining useful life of the car and claim straight line depreciation. Now, here's an example where the standard mileage rate was not claimed in the first year, and so this filer is not allowed to claim it. Larry is an employee who occasionally uses his own car for business purposes. He purchased the car in 2010. Because Larry did not use the standard mileage rate for the first year that the car was available for business use, he cannot use the standard mileage rate in 2012 to claim the unreimbursed employee business expenses. That one seems a little bit odd, but that's what the IRS publication is saying. Leased autos. If you want to use the standard mileage rate for a car you lease, you must use it for the entire lease period for leases that began on or before December 31, 1997. The standard mileage rate must be used for the entire portion of the lease period. And let's take a look at what the standard mileage rate is meant to claim. So if you're giving up actual so that you then can claim standard, that standard mileage rate is claiming expenses that fall into a variety of categories. And examples include depreciation, gas, insurance, lease payments, licenses, oil changes, and other maintenance costs, registration fees, repairs, and tires. You must choose the standard mileage rate the first year you used your car for business. If you cannot claim actual expenses, or if you did claim actual expenses on a car that you lease rather than own, you cannot then claim the standard mileage rate in another year. If you claim standard mileage allowance on a car that you lease rather than you own, you cannot claim the actual expenses in a later year, and this rule does not apply, though, to a car that you own. If you choose the standard mileage rate, you cannot claim actual costs for operating your car in the same year. And even if you claim the standard mileage rate, you are still allowed to claim costs 
for parking and tolls. The parking and tolls are not considered to be included in the standard mileage rate. They would be on top of it. And number seven, you cannot claim the standard rate if any of the following are true. You operate five or more cars at the same time in your business because if you do, you're considered to have a fleet. Or you claim dep depreciation deduction other than straight line depreciation for that vehicle in an earlier year. You claim a Section 179 deduction for the car in an earlier year. Or you are a rural male carrier who received a qualified reimbursement or you claimed actual expenses on a leased car. When claiming standard mileage, you will multiply the number of business miles driven by the standard mileage rate. For actual expenses, types of expenses that you would claim are all the ones I listed previously, depreciation, garage rent, gas oil, insurance, lease payments, license and registration fees, repairs and replacement tires, and tolls. Tolls are not a part of the standard mileage rate, but they are certainly part of actual expenses that are deductible. Even if you claim actual expenses, you must track the number of business miles you drive so that you can prorate your cost between business and personal use. And here's an example. And the reason I've got this in there in that explanation is that I have a lot of clients who will say things like, well, I'm just going to claim actual expenses this year because I didn't keep a mileage log. Well, you have to keep a mileage log whether you claim actual expenses or the standard mileage allowance because you use the mileage log to establish your percent business use. And here we go with an example. You drove your car 15,000 miles during 2012. 10,000 miles were personal, 5,000 were business. Your actual cost for the entire vehicle or operating the entire vehicle was $7,000 for the year, and you're going to figure your allowable deduction as follows. 5,000 business miles divided by 15,000 total miles multiplied by 7,000 equals $2,333. That's the allowable deduction. Personal versus business use. If you use your car for business and personal use, you must maintain adequate records to show your business use. Acceptable methods of tracking business use include keeping a mileage log, and the log should record the following information, the date you drove, the places you traveled to, the miles driven, and even the reason for travel. Number two, use your personal calendar of appointments to log miles driven for the appointments. You may use the actual expenses or the standard mileage rate in any year so long as you use the standard mileage rate in the first year that the car is available for use in your business. However, if you switch to actual expenses in a year following a year where you claim the standard mileage rate, you must use straight line depreciation. Interest in car loans. Whether you claim a deduction for interest you paid on your car loan depends on if you are self-employed or an employee. Employees are never allowed to deduct interest they paid as an employee business expense, but interest paid on car loans is considered to be personal interest and therefore is not deductible. But if you're self-employed, you are allowed to deduct the business interest portion of the amount of interest that you paid on a car loan for a vehicle that you use on your Schedule C. Sell, trade in, or otherwise dispose of the car. If you sell, trade in, or otherwise dispose of the car you used for business, you will need to report the disposition of that vehicle on Form 4797. This is because you will need to determine whether you have a gain or a loss on the disposition of the vehicle. You determine your amount of gain or loss by subtracting the sales price of the vehicle from your cost basis after you factor for depreciation. You must also factor for depreciation even if you claimed the standard mileage rate instead of actual expenses. Here's an illustration where an individual has sold her car. Jan sold her 1998 Ford Taurus for $3,000. In earlier years, she claimed expense deductions for the car. Since Jan previously claimed a deduction for business use of her Taurus, she must report the sale of her car on Form 4797. In illustration number two, we have an involuntary conversion of a business use vehicle. Jan totaled her 1998 Taurus. The vehicle was not insured and she received no payment for scrap value. Since Jan previously claimed a deduction for business use of her Taurus, she will need to report that disposition on Form 4797. And next we have allowable car expenses. If you use your car for business, you can claim the actual cost of operating the vehicle or you may be able to claim a standard mileage allowance. Whichever method you use, you do need to keep accurate records to prove your business use. In other words, you need to keep a mileage log. Figuring depreciation when the standard mileage rate was claimed. So essentially, each dollar that you're able to deduct under the standard mileage rate, a portion of that is considered to be for depreciation on the vehicle. 
For 2012, the standard mileage rate is 55 and a half cents a mile. And inside of that 55 cents and a half per mile, we have another 23 cents that is for depreciation. So of the 55.5 cents per mile, 23 cents is for depreciation and the balance is for the operational cost of the vehicle. You can see going back in time, the portion of each cents per mile amount under the standard mileage rate has been dropping over time. In other words, it's been increasing over time. Commissions and fees. If you paid commissions and fees to other individuals or businesses, report the amount here. Note that if you paid an unincorporated business $600 or more, you must issue a Form 1099 miscellaneous. Unless, of course, you paid them on credit card. Deduct expenses paid for services performed by non-employees. We're on the contractor line now. Note that if you paid an individual $600 or more for contract labor or for services performed in your trade or business, you do need to give them that 1099 miscellaneous. Line 12 is for depletion, but it's only used by companies that are in the commercial business of harvesting timber. Your typical homeowner or landowner who has timber on the land and decides to cut it down and sell it is going to report that sale on Schedule D. But if you are a timber company and you're claiming a depletion deduction for your trees, then you need to attach Form T to your return for sale of any trees. Depreciation and Section 179 expense deduction. If you place property in service or had listed property in service during the year, you need to attach this form to return. Otherwise, you must maintain an accurate depreciation schedule for your records, which shows how you calculated your depreciation deduction. Employee benefit programs. Enter the cost of accident health plans, group term life insurance, and dependent care assistance programs you paid for the employees here. Do not claim any expenses you paid for yourself. You may claim expenses you paid for your spouse or other members of your family, only if they were employees to whom you issued a W-2. So again, earlier in today's class, I mentioned that it is possible for a sole proprietor to employ his or her wife or husband, in other words, spouse, as an employee. And if you employed your spouse as an employee and you issued them a W-2, it's also possible that you could cover them under an employer plan for employee benefit payments. And if you did that, you can deduct it. But under no situation can a sole proprietor claim a deduction on Schedule C for contributions they made to their own retirement accounts, only to employee ones. Line 15, insurance other than health. On this line, you would deduct liability, hazard, and workers' compensation insurance. On line 16, this is for the interest. You can deduct interest you paid for loans you took out for business use. You must be liable for the debt and you must have actually paid the debt. Line 16A is for mortgages paid to banks, etc. If you owned mortgage property such as an office building and received a Form 1098 or similar statement, report the amount of interest you paid here. Do not report mortgage interest you paid on your home. And then finally, line 16, report the business use portion of interest on credit cards you used for your business, mortgage interest you paid on property where there was no Form 1098 received, and other interest amounts that were paid to your business or by your business during the year. So I did want to point out the difference here between line 16A and 16B. If you make an entry on line 16A, the IRS is going to be looking for a corresponding 1098 that will match that. And of course, the 1098 document is the document issued by lenders to show mortgage payments received or interest received on loans. And so if you are filling out a Schedule C and you have a document like that showing that interest was paid to a financial bank or mortgage company based on real estate, then that 1098 needs to be issued. And if it is issued, you would show the amount of interest on that 1098 on line 16A. But if no 1098 is issued, then you would not make an entry on line 16A because if you do make an entry on line 16A and there is no 1099, that could trigger the IRS to send a letter saying, hey, you claimed a deduction that we have no record you're entitled to. Line 17, legal and professional. Include on this line fees charged by accountants and attorneys that are ordinary and necessary expenses directly related to operating your business. You include fees for tax advice related to your business and for preparation of tax forms related to your business on this line. Also include expenses incurred in resolving asserted tax deficiencies. Line 18, office expense, include office supplies and postage here. Line 19, pension and profit sharing plans. Enter your deduction for contributions to a pension, profit sharing, or annuity plan on this line. And if you're required to, you may also need to file Form 5500, which is an obligation of employers who do have pension plans for their employees. Line 20 is for rent or lease. 
You may deduct expenses you paid to rent buildings or other property for use in your business. If you rented vehicles, machinery, equipment, that goes on line 20A. And if you rented other properties such as an office space or a building, you would make an entry on line 20B. Line 21, repairs and maintenance. Center on this line, the cost of labor and supplies used to maintain or repair business property. Do not include any of the following expenses on this line. Repairs to office use of home, improvements to property that change or extend its useful life, or the value of your own labor. Supplies are items you consume or use up, and examples of supplies include small tools with a useful life of one year or less used by a furnace installation business, or shampoo, conditioner, and perming solution used in a beauty salon. In most cases, you can deduct the cost of materials and supplies only to the extent that you actually consumed and used them in your business through the tax year. However, if you had incidental materials and supplies on hand for which you kept no inventory or records of use, you can deduct the cost of those that you actually purchased during the year, provided that this method clearly reflects your income. You can also deduct the cost of books, professional instruments, equipment, etc. if you normally use them within a year. However, if their usefulness extends substantially beyond a year, then you typically need to depreciate them. So the next item we're looking at is child daycare and adult foster care provider meal expenses. If you provide meals to your employees or to customers or patients in the normal course of your business, you should claim these expenses as a supply expense and not as a meals or entertainment expense subject to the 50% limit. Meal daycare providers, back in 2003, the IRS came out with a new system. It's been around for 10 years now, of course, still relatively new in the world of the University of Tax Law. And from tax years beginning in 2013 or later, you can actually use a per diem amount to deduct for the cost of food that you give to each child rather than claiming the actual expenses. There's nothing to stop you from continuing to claim actual expenses if that's what you'd rather do. But you can choose to throw out the actual expense deduction and go with the standard meal allowance instead. And here we have a description of what's going on. In order, to obviously, to claim this particular expense, you have to be a family daycare provider. And a family daycare provider is a person engaged in the business of providing family daycare. Family daycare is a child care provided to eligible children in the home of the family uh, daycare provider that meets all of the following requirements. The child care is non-medical, a legal transfer of custody is not evolved, and the child care is generally lasting less than 24 hours each day. Eligible children. Eligible children are minor children receiving family daycare in the home of the family daycare provider. Eligible children do not include children who are full-time or part-time residents of the home where the child care is provided or children whose parents or guardians are residents of the same home. And here we have an example where children of provider are not eligible for the daily meal rate. A family child care provider's own children and any children who live in the family daycare provider's home on a full-time or part-time basis are not eligible children, even if they receive daycare services from a family daycare provider. And here are the amounts that are allowed if you're going to go ahead and claim the daily meal allowance or the daily meal rate. For most of the United States, you're going to get $1.24 for breakfast, $2.32 for lunch, $2.32 for dinner, and $0.69 cents for each snack. But if you live in Hawaii or Alaska, the amount you are allowed for each category is higher. A family child care provider who chooses to use the standard meal and snack allowance for a particular tax year must use the tax rates for all deductible food costs for eligible children during that tax year. And here we have an illustration of how all that works. In other words, a family daycare provider who's going to claim the standard meal and snack rate, what is that total up to? Sandy Muffet runs Little Tuffet's daycare from her home. During the year, she cared for the following children who were with her under her care for the number of days and meals shown. And so the IRS record keeping procedures are that the daycare provider who wishes to claim the standard meal and snack rate, they need to actually keep good records of the children that were with them on any particular day when they arrived and when they left. That is a requirement that IRS has. And so we're assuming that Sandy Muffet has the type of records necessary. We've got Jack, Jill, Hansel, and Gretel, and the number of meals provided to each of those people. So we total up all of the meals provided to the four children. We get 250 for breakfast. For lunch, we have 250. For dinner, we have 50. And for snack, we have 500. 
we then take those amounts and multiply them by the amount per meal that the IRS allows. Breakfast is $1.24, lunch $2.32, dinner $2.32, and a snack is $0.69. Cents. When we finish multiplying all those out, we get $1,351, and that would be the amount to enter as a supply expense on the Schedule C. Line 23, Taxes and Licenses. You can deduct the following taxes and licenses on this line. It includes state and local sales tax imposed on the seller of goods or services. If you collected this tax from the buyer, you must also include the amount collected in gross receipts or sales on line one. Real estate and personal property taxes on business assets. Licenses and regulatory fees for your trade or business paid each year to state or local governments. These are deductible. But some licenses, such as liquor licenses, do have to be amortized rather than deducted. Social Security and Medicare taxes paid to match required withholding from your employer's wages. Reduce the deduction you claim for Social Security and Medicare taxes paid on employee wages by the amount that you were able to claim as a credit on Form 8846. Federal unemployment tax paid, federal highway use tax, these are all amounts that are deductible. And contributions to a state unemployment insurance fund or disability benefit fund if they are considered taxes under state law. But taxes you are not allowed to deduct include federal income taxes, including the self-employment tax, estate and gift taxes, taxes assessed to pay for improvements, taxes on your home, state and local sales taxes on property purchased for use in your business, and state and local taxes imposed on the buyer that you were required to collect and pay over to the state government. So on one side we had sales tax gets reported on line six, and then over here IRS is saying don't do that. You don't record the income and you don't deduct the expense. So the subtle difference between them would be if you're doing a cashier in a bookstore, say, who rings up sales of $100 from a particular client, that is going to, and you're in a state that there's sales tax, the sales tax would be collected from that client at the same time. And the IRS says, in that situation, do not report the sales tax as a deduction, but also do not report the sales tax as income. But there appear to be a few situations where a business might have money held in trust for a state or local government. And if it does, then it's not really reportable at all. But if they're falling into that category where it is reportable, it goes on line six and they need to deduct the payout going on the tax line. Scotia. S-C-O-T-I-A. Scotia. Well, travel expenses is just one line on the tax return. There's a lot to say about whether or not you're allowed to claim a deduction for your travel, and there's pages after page after page in the IRS instructions about what is allowed under travel, especially when we get into travel outside of the United States. I did take a peek at a few C questions from the IRS's special enrollment exam, and they do ask quite a few expenses about travel outside of the United States, so this is important stuff that you do need to understand if at any time you're planning on sitting that C exam. To claim travel expenses, you must have a regular place of abode in a real and substantial sense. You have a regular place of abode if all of the following is true. You work in the same vicinity as your claimed abode and you use it while you're doing business. Your living expenses incurred at your claimed abode are duplicated when you're away on business and you have not abandoned the vicinity in which your place of lodging and claimed abode are both located or you have family member or members, marital or lineal, currently residing at the claimed abode, or you use that claimed abode frequently. The IRS says you need to have an abode, and if you want to travel away from home on business, then you need to have an abode that you are traveling away from. You also need to have a tax home. Your tax home is the place where your regular place of business or post of duty is located, regardless of where you maintain the family home. It includes the entire city or general area where your main place of business or work is located, and you can claim the cost of expenses you incur while traveling away from your tax home overnight. If you do not have a regular place of business or post of duty and there is no place that you regularly live, you are considered to be a transient, and your tax home is wherever you happen to work. As a transient, you can never be away from your tax home, so your travel expenses are never deductible. Main place of business or work. If you have more than one place of work, consider the following when determining which is your main place of business or work. The total time you ordinarily spend in each place, 
the level of your business activity in each place, and whether your income from each place is significant or insignificant. Traveling away from home. You are considered to be traveling away from home if your duties require you to be away from the general area of your tax home substantially longer than an ordinary day's work, and you need, as a result of that travel, to sleep or rest to meet the demands of your work while you are traveling away from home. This rest requirement is not satisfied merely by napping in your car. You do not have to be away from your tax home for a whole day or from dawn until dusk as long as the relief from duty is long enough for you to get the necessary rest or sleep. And here is an example of qualifying travel out of Virus Publication 463. You are a railroad conductor. You leave your home terminal on a regularly scheduled round trip between two cities and return home 16 hours later. During the run, you have six hours off at your turnaround point where you eat two meals and rent a hotel room to get necessary sleep before starting the return trip. In this situation, you are considered to be traveling away from home. In example number two, the IRS says we do not have travel. You are a truck driver. You leave your terminal and return to it later that same day. You get an hour off at the turnaround point to eat. Because you are not off to get necessary sleep and the brief time is not an adequate rest period, you are not traveling away from home. Temporary assignment or job. In order to claim certain transportation and travel expenses, you need to be able to show that you have a temporary assignment at a location that is away from your tax home. If you do, you can deduct temporary living expenses as travel expenses subject to the following rules. Your assignment must be considered temporary in order for you to claim the expenses. A temporary assignment is one that you realistically expect will last one year or less, and it does in fact last one year or less. But if your assignment is indefinite, that is expected to last more than a year, the location of your assignment becomes your new tax home and the cost is not deductible. So how do you go about determining indefinite or temporary? When do you have that? To determine if your travel is temporary or indefinite, you should apply the following rules. Number one, if you are indefinitely assigned to a work location, then that work location becomes your tax home. You must determine if your assignment is indefinite or temporary when you start to work. You may claim temporary living expenses while you are away from home up until the first date that you become aware that your assignment has become indefinite or will last more than a year. So let's think about an example where that would happen. You are working on a six-month contract for an employer in San Francisco. They've brought you in and they are going to keep you there working, and this is a self-employment course, so let's make it a situation where you are working as an independent contractor for a company in San Francisco. So you travel to San Francisco and you have temporary living expenses while you are in San Francisco working for that company. And the law says you can write off the travel expenses associated for working for that business in California, but only if you have a regular tax home that you're traveling away from and only if you expect that assignment to be temporary. Let's suppose at the end of the first six months, you are offered an opportunity to renew the contract for another year. And so you look at the calendar and you say, yeah, I'll take another year here. Well, on that day that you went from six months to one year, you're still safe because one year is not more than a year. And the IRS says you are no longer allowed to claim expenses when you are aware that you will be working there more than a year. But let's just suppose right around the 10 month part, you're four months into the six month extension, the company that you're working for says, no, we'd like you to stay on board for another full year. Well, on that day in the 10 months, you are now aware that the assignment is gonna run more than a year. And so on that day in the 10 months, your travel expenses would no longer be deductible. Also, members of the armed forces who are on permanent duty assignment overseas, they are not considered to be traveling away from home. And naval personnel assigned on ships with eating and sleeping facilities are considered to have a tax home aboard ship for travel purposes. If you are on a probationary assignment with the understanding that you will keep your job upon satisfactory completion of the probationary period, your assignment is considered to be indefinite for travel purposes. And going home on your day off, if you travel home on your days off to visit your family, you can claim travel expenses equivalent to what meals and lodging would have cost you had you stayed in your temporary home. So what this is saying is you've traveled to a temporary work location and while you're there, you're paying costs for staying there. And you want to go home on a weekend to visit your family. Can you deduct the travel from going from your temporary work location home over the weekend? The IRS says yes, but only to the extent that it would have cost you to stay in the temporary work location. 
So let's just suppose, going back to the example with San Francisco, you're in San Francisco for a six-month project, and each weekend you want to fly home to be with your family. So you have to pay the round-trip airfare on coming home on Friday and going back out on Sunday so that you can be at work on Monday each week. And the IRS says you can deduct that, but only to the extent that it would have cost you to stay in San Francisco. So you have to look at what the cost of staying in San Francisco is. If you're paying a monthly hotel amount and it's $100 a night and the airfare is going to cost you $300 to come home, well, you're going to miss out two nights of hotel costing $200. So the IRS says you could deduct $200, even though the cost of returning home is $300. Qualifying travel expenses. IRS rules consider travel expenses to be the ordinary and necessary expenses of traveling away from home for your business, profession, or job. The primary reason for the trip must be business in order for you to deduct the expenses. How do you determine if the reason for the trip is business? Well, the IRS says if it is primarily for business, you can deduct all of your necessary travel expenses, but you may not deduct costs associated with personal side trips or to lengthen your stay for personal reasons. And here we have an illustration where a trip is primarily for business. You travel to Hawaii for a convention, and the convention lasts for three days, but you stay a week to enjoy a short vacation. You may deduct the cost of traveling to and from Hawaii and the cost associated with meals and lodging surrounding the convention. The cost for meals and lodging you incur during your additional vacation time is not deductible. Trip is primarily for personal reasons. If your trip is for primarily for personal reasons, you are not allowed to deduct any of your travel expenses. But if you incur direct business expenses while on your trip, you may deduct those business expenses. And here's an illustration where a trip is primarily personal. You travel to Hawaii for a week's vacation, and while in Hawaii, you attend a one-day seminar related to your business. You cannot deduct any of the costs associated with travel to or from Hawaii, and also you cannot deduct the cost of lodging or meals while you're in Hawaii. So it's a personal trip, you travel to Hawaii, while you're there, you happen to go to a convention for a day. IRS says no to all of it, except the cost of attending the seminar or the convention, you can deduct that. Cost of bringing friends and family members with you, the additional amount you pay to bring family members with you is not deductible. However, of course, if this is a business trip and you regularly employ your spouse and issue your spouse a W-2, the cost of bringing your spouse along could be a legitimate business expense, but you'd have to be able to show that the spouse was acting as your employee in your business. And here we have another illustration where the spouse travels with you and is not an employee. You travel to Hawaii to attend a four-day seminar. Your spouse decides to travel with you. Because of a package deal you were able to purchase, the cost of staying in Hawaii for seven days is the same as the cost for staying for four. You can deduct all the cost of travel, meals, and lodging for yourself, but you cannot deduct any costs associated with your spouse traveling with you. And this is true even if your spouse assists you with performing your job duties. Travel outside of the United States. IRS rules governing the deductibility of expenses for travel outside of the United States are different and more restrictive than they are for business travel inside of the United States. How much of the travel expense you are allowed to deduct when you travel outside of the United States it depends in part on how much of the trip outside of the U.S. was business related. You can deduct all of your travel expenses of getting to and from your business destination if the travel was entirely for business or it was considered to be entirely for business. So when is travel considered to be entirely business? Even if you did not spend your entire time on business activities, your trip is considered entirely for business if you meet at least one of the following four exceptions. Exemption number one is that you have no substantial control. Your trip is entirely for business if you do not have substantial control over arranging the trip. You do not have substantial control if all of the following apply. You are an employee who was reimbursed or paid a travel expense allowance and you are not related to your employer and you are not a managing executive. Exception number two, outside of the United States, but not more than for a week. Your trip is considered entirely for business if you are outside of the United States for a week or less, combining business and non-business activities. One week means seven consecutive days. In counting the days, do not count the days you leave the United States, but do count the days that you return to the United States. Example, travel outside of the United States was not more than one week. You traveled to London on a trip that was primarily for business. You left Austin on Tuesday and flew to New York. 
Wednesday afternoon, you boarded the flight to London and arrived in London on Thursday morning. On Thursday and Friday, you had business discussions, and from Saturday and Tuesday, you were sightseeing. You flew back to New York, arriving Wednesday afternoon, and on Thursday, you flew back to London. So essentially, you're in London for a few days for business, and then you extend your stay or you stay longer. And the IRS says none of that really matters as long as you're gone one week or less. And in this case, although you were away from your home in Austin for more than a week, you were not outside of the United States for more than a week. And this is because the day you depart does not count as a day outside of the United States. Your travel expenses are deductible as follows. You can deduct your cost of the round-trip flight between Austin and London. You can deduct the cost of your layover in New York. You can deduct the cost of your stay in London for Thursday and Friday while you conducted business, but you cannot deduct the cost of your stay in London from Saturday through Tuesday because those days were spent on non-business activities. Exception number three, less than 25% of the time is on personal activities. Your trip is considered to be entirely for business if you were outside of the United States for more than a week and you spend less than 25% of your total time you were outside of the United States on non-business activities. And here's an example of less than 25% of the time was spent on non-business activities. You traveled for 21 days on a business trip from Los Angeles to Beijing as follows. You spent 14 days on business, you spent five days sightseeing, and you spent one day flying in each direction. Because only five of the 21 days, or 521s, less than 25%, of your total time abroad was for non-business activities, you can deduct as travel expense what it would have cost you to make the trip if you had not engaged in any non-business activity. The amount you can deduct includes the cost of the round-trip airfare and 16 days of meals, subject to the 50% limit, lodging and other related expenses. And then we have exception number four. You can still deduct all the costs associated with travel for business if you meet exception number four. Vacation is not a material consideration. Your trip is considered entirely for business if you can establish that a personal vacation was not a major consideration, even if you have substantial control over arranging the trip. Travel primarily for business. If you travel outside of the United States primarily for business, but spend some of your time doing personal activities, the following rules apply. You can deduct the business portion of your cost of getting to and from your destination but you must allocate or prorate other travel costs between your business and personal activities to determine the deductible amount. Now, one of the things that went on a few years ago, I had a client who was audited. She deserved to be audited. Her stuff was a mess, and she wasn't my client. She was a client of someone else in her office, but she could have been mine. We all get clients like this. They bring in their expenses. We prepare the return, and then when the audit letter comes, you see what they really had, and her stuff was pretty bad. She traveled to Europe wanted to deduct a bunch of expenses that she said were related to her time in Europe, but she'd also bought airfare tickets simultaneously for her children. Her family lived in Europe, and she claimed that she was driving all over Europe conducting business. And quite frankly, from my perspective, when I saw what was really going on, I was of the opinion she wasn't going to be allowed to claim anything as far as the IRS audit was concerned. But in the end, the IRS audit actually did allow her quite a bit of her expense. I was really quite surprised about how much they allowed her. And I think some of what went on with the auditor and what they did allow has to do with what we're coming up against here in terms of the number of days and where the business activity was spent and the amount of time being spent. They actually did come up, I imagine, with some kind of formula for determining how much she was allowed. And I do see a question here, rental cars? Are you allowed to deduct the cost of rental cars? Well, if a rental car is associated with business travel and you meet all the conditions for being allowed to deduct business travel, a rental car would certainly be allowed. So let's look at the travel allocation rules if you travel primarily for business. If your trip was outside of the United States and was primarily for business, you must allocate your travel time on a day-to-day -day basis between business days and non-business days. The days you depart from and return to the United States are both counted as days outside of the United States. To figure the deductible amount of your round-trip travel expenses, use the following. The total number of business days outside of the United States divided by the total number of business and non-business days of travel. In counting business days, include transportation days, days your presence was required, days you spent on business, and certain weekends and holidays. A transportation day is any day you spend traveling to or from a business destination. However, if because of a non-business activity, you do not travel by a direct route, your business days are the days it would have taken you to travel a reasonably direct route to your business destination.
Extra days for side trips or non-business activity cannot be counted as business days. We have a presence requirement. Count as a business day any day that your presence is required at a particular place for a specific business purpose. Count it as a business day even if you spend most of your day on non-business activities. So if you fly to Paris, France, because your presence is physically required at a one-hour meeting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and you attend the meeting as you are required, and you have no other business activity for the rest of that day, Iris says that's okay. It's still going to be counted as a business day. Days spent on business. If your principal activity during work hours is the pursuit of your trade or business, count the day as a business day. Also count as a business day any day you are prevented from working because of circumstances beyond your control. Let's see, there was a, some strikes in France not that long ago where the whole city was shut down. The whole cities were shut down because people are on strike. That would be an example where you can't get anywhere or do anything because of a strike. Certain weekends and holidays. You count weekends, holidays, and unnecessary standby days as business days if they fall between business days. But if they follow your business meetings or activity and you remain at your business destination for non-business or personal reasons, do not count them as business days. And here we have an example where a weekend falls between business days. Your travel home is San Francisco and you travel to Vancouver, Canada, where you have a business meeting on Friday. You have another appointment on the following Monday. Because your presence was required on both Friday and Monday, they are business days. The weekend is between the business days, therefore Saturday and Sunday are counted as business days. You can count the weekend days as business days, even if you use that time for sightseeing, visiting friends, or other non-business activities. But in example number two, we have a weekend that falls after business days. Assume the same facts as in example one, except that you had no business in Vancouver on Monday. You arrived in Vancouver and you stayed over the weekend when you could have flown home on Saturday morning instead. Since there's no business need to stay in Vancouver, the Saturday and Sunday would be non-business days. Then we have non-business activity on the way to or from your business destination. If you stopped for a short vacation or other non-business activity, either on the way from the United States to your business location or on the way back to the United States from your business destination, you must allocate part of your travel to the non-business activity. The part you must allocate is the amount it would have cost you to travel between the point where travel outside of the United States begins and your non-business destination, and a return to the point where travel outside of the United States ends. You determine the non-business portion of that expense by multiplying by the following fraction. And the IRS says you take the number of non-business days during your travel outside of the United States and you divide that by the total number of days you spend outside of the United States. And it's a rather confusing description, so I turned it into an illustration to show you what IRS means by all of that. We have an example here of non-business activity on the way to or from a business destination. In this situation, you live in New Jersey, and on June 12, you flew to Frankfurt to attend a business conference that began on the 13th. The conference ended at noon on June 21st, and that evening you flew to London, where you visited with friends until the afternoon of June 29 when you flew directly home to back to New Jersey following that. The primary purpose of the trip was to attend the conference. So essentially we have travel from New Jersey to Frankfurt, and the direct route home would have been Frankfurt back to New Jersey. But instead of doing that, you said, ah, I'm going to go to London. And you went from Frankfurt to London, and then after you were done in London, you flew back to New Jersey. So we call London the non-business destination. If you had not stopped in London, you would have arrived home the morning of June 22. You do not meet any of the exceptions that would allow you to consider your travel entirely for business. June 12 through June 22, 11 days, are business days, and June 23 through 29, 7 business days, are non-business days. You can deduct the cost of your meals subject to the 50% limit, lodging, and other business-related travel expenses while you are in Frankfurt. You cannot deduct your expenses while in London. You also cannot deduct 7 18 of what it would have cost you to travel round-trip between New Jersey and London. Your travel costs were as follows. So in this situation, we're telling you that we're allowed to deduct seven, right here, seven eighteenths is the amount that you're allowed to deduct of the total ticket from London back to New Jersey. So this is interesting. They're saying, even though you took a personal side trip there, we're not just going to throw out the London trip and say you can't deduct any of it. What we're saying is that probably you paid more to fly in directly than it would have been directly. And the formula we're going to use to figure out how much it would have cost you is this one. We're going to take the total non-business days of travel 
and divide that by the total days traveled, 7 18 We then look at how much it costs you to fly from New Jersey to Frankfurt, how much to fly from Frankfurt to London, and how much to fly from London back to New Jersey. And if you had just gone New Jersey to London and back again, the ticket would have been $1,250. You never bought the $1,250 because you did these options here instead. And how you're going to figure the deductible part of your travel expenses is as follows. You multiply the cost of direct round-trip travel to London by the fraction shown below. And that says $1,250 of what it would have cost you if you had bought a round-trip ticket. You didn't, but you need to know what it would have been if you would bought it. And then you multiply that by 7 18 and when you do so, you get $486. You then take the $486 and subtract it from the total expenses paid of $1,850. And once you subtract it from $1,850, you're left with a deductible travel expense of $1,364. Non-business activity at or near or beyond the business destination. If you had a vacation or other non-business activity at, near, or beyond your business destination, you must allocate part of your travel expenses to the non-business activity. The part you must allocate is the amount it would have cost you to travel between the point where your travel outside of the United States begins and your business destination and a return to the point where travel outside of the United States ends. You determine the non-business portion of that expense by multiplying it by that same fraction we saw earlier. The number of non-business days during your travel outside of the United States divided by the total number of days you spend outside of the United States. None of your travel expenses for non-business activities at, near, or beyond your business destination is deductible. So here we have another example where the non-business activity is beyond the business destination and not a part of going to or from the business destination. Assume that the dates are the same as in the previous example, but that instead of going to London for your vacation, you flew to Venice for a vacation you had the following travel expenses for that trip. Lodging meals and other expenses while you were in Frankfurt, 4000 Air for and travel related to the trip from New Jersey to Frankfurt and back again, 1750 And then the travel to Venice was a nice round $2,000. IRS says that you cannot deduct any part of the $2,000 cost you paid to go from Frankfurt to Venice and then return to Frankfurt. But they also say that part of the airfare of going from New Jersey to Frankfurt is going to be limited, reduced, or taken away. And you can see in the first illustration we had travel from New Jersey to Frankfurt and then Frankfurt to London and then home again. And in this situation, we're going from New Jersey to Frankfurt. And then once we're in Frankfurt, we're going to this other destination, Venice, and then we're going back to Frankfurt. And then from Frankfurt, we're flying home. If you do that, then your deduction for other travel expenses is going to be limited as follows. You cannot deduct 7 18 of the airfare and other expenses from New Jersey to Frankfurt and back to New Jersey. You can deduct 11 18 of the round-trip plane fare and other travel expenses from New Jersey to Frankfurt. And you can deduct your meals subject to the 50% limit, lodging, and any other expenses you had while you were in Frankfurt. You figure your travel deduction as follows. You're going to take 11 18 which is the qualifying business travel days, out of the total days traveled, multiply that by the cost of the airfare, 1750, and when you do that, you get $1,069. Your allowable deduction for travel expenses will therefore be 5069. You're going to take 1069 for the travel to and from Frankfurt plus the $4,000 you paid for lodging, meal, and other expenses while you were in Frankfurt. Other methods? You can use another method for counting business days if you establish that it more clearly reflects the time spent on other than business activities outside of the United States. And now we have travel primarily for personal reasons. If you travel outside of the United States primarily for vacation or for investment purposes, the entire cost of the trip is a non-deductible personal expense. However, if you spend some time attending brief professional seminars or a continuing education program, you can deduct your registration fees and other expenses you have that are directly related to your business. And here we have luxury water travel. I don't think there's too many people traveling by water to business destinations anymore, but this is what this particular illustration is talking about. A while back, I taught this topic in a different class, and at that time, I kind of gave the Titanic as an illustration. Back in the days of the Titanic, turn of the 20th century there, Lots of people traveled by water. Not very many people could travel by plane, and back then I don't know that a plane could make it across the Atlantic, so traveling by boat was the norm. 
And of course, in our modern time, traveling by boat would be unusual and considered to be a luxury type of thing. Why would anyone travel by boat? And if they do travel by boat, should the IRS allow that deduction? Well, interestingly, they do. The IRS says if you want to take a ship from San Francisco to Hawaii to attend a business convention, they'll allow that. It doesn't seem to be a very practical way of getting there, but there is a limit on what they will allow. If you travel by ocean liner, cruise ship, or other form of luxury water transportation for business purposes, there is a daily limit on the amount that you are allowed to deduct. The limit is twice the highest federal per diem rate allowable at the time of your travel as shown on the following table. So the normal highest federal per diem rate in January through March 31 is $367, and that would be doubled to give you the amount or the limit that you could deduct on daily luxury water travel. We have an example here of how that would work. Shelley traveled on an ocean liner from New York to Paris on business in May. Her expense for the six-day cruise was $6,000. Shelley's deduction for the cruise cannot exceed $3,744. That's six days times the $624 daily limit in play for May. And you can see here that travel by water between April and June is $624 a day, and May falls in that range. And that's why she's allowed $624 times the six days, which I think is actually pretty generous because it's hard for me to imagine why they would allow anything in that regard, but they do. Meals and entertainment. If your expenses for luxury water travel include separately stated amounts for meals or entertainment, these amounts are subject to the 50% limit on meals and entertainment before you apply the daily limit. Not separately stated. If your meal or entertainment charges are not separately stated or are not clearly identifiable, you do not have to allocate any portion of the total charge to meals or entertainment. So if you're traveling by luxury water and you're given a flat bill for the entire trip, you're allowed to claim up to twice the federal per diem rate for each day you're on that trip, or the actual cost, whichever is less. Now, if there's no separately stated amount on the bill for the cost of meals, you can deduct the whole thing as travel. But if any part of the bill is broken out and said it's for meals, then you're only allowed to deduct 50% of that portion that is for meals. Now, we have some exceptions to these rules. The daily limit on luxury water travel does not apply to expenses you have to attend a convention, seminar, or meeting on board of a cruise ship. So up until this point with luxury water travel, I've been talking about using a ship to get from one destination to another. In the case of conventions on board luxury liners, however, the destination is the luxury liner. It's not wherever the luxury liner is headed. So can you deduct that? Well, for conventions on board luxury liners, you can deduct your travel expenses when you attend the convention subject to the following rules. The convention agenda or program shows the purpose of the convention. The agenda is related to your position in such a way that it shows your attendance was for a business purpose. You can show that your attendance benefits your trade or business, but you cannot deduct the travel expenses of your family. If the convention is for investment, political, social, or other purposes unrelated to your trade or business, you cannot deduct those expenses. Conventions held outside of the North American area you cannot deduct expenses for attending a convention, seminar, or similar meeting held outside of North America unless the meeting is directly related to your trade or business and it is reasonable to hold the meeting outside of the North American area. The North American area is described in this table. If you see the country listed, it's considered to be a part of the North American area. The North American area also includes U.S. islands, caves, and reefs that are possessions of the United States and not a part of the 50 states or the District of Columbia. Reasonableness test. If you want to claim the cost of attending a convention on board a luxury liner, the expense has to be reasonable. The following factors are taken into account to determine if there's a reasonableness to holding the meeting outside of North America. The purpose of the meeting and the activities taking place at the meeting. The purpose and activities of the sponsoring organizations or groups. The homes of the active members or the sponsoring organizations and the places at which other meetings of the sponsoring organization or group have been held or will be held and other relevant facts you may present. So essentially, Iris says if you attend a meeting on board a cruise liner or a convention on board a cruise liner, it has to be inside of North America. And it might be allowed outside of North America if it's reasonable to do it. And then they, they look at a reasonableness test. What are the reasons why it was being held outside of the North American area? And if they can see that it was reasonable, then they might still allow it. 
For cruise ships, you can deduct up to $2,000 per year of your expenses of attending convention seminars or similar meetings held on cruise ships. All ships that sail are considered to be cruise ships. You can deduct these expenses only if all of the following requirements are met. The convention, seminar, or meeting is directly related to your trade or business. The cruise ship is a vessel registered in the United States. All of the cruise ship's ports of call are in the United States or in possessions of the United States. You attach to your return a written statement signed by you that includes information about the total days of the trip, not including days of transportation to and from the cruise port, the number of hours each day that you devote to a scheduled business activity and a program of the scheduled business activities of the meeting. You attach to your return a written statement signed by an officer of the organization or group sponsoring the meetings that includes a schedule of the business activities of each day of the meeting and the number of hours that you attend the scheduled meetings or activities. And the next topic we're on to now is meals. Or am I allowed to claim a business deduction on Schedule C for the cost of meals? Unless you meet the rules for business entertainment, you cannot deduct the cost of meals unless it is necessary for you to stop for rest or to properly perform your duties. For your allowable meal expenses, if you do have them, you can use the actual cost of meals or if you are traveling away from home overnight only, you can also claim the actual cost of meals or the standard meal allowance. So anytime you eat meals locally in the area or vicinity of your tax home, you're allowed only the actual cost of the meal and you need to be able to show there was a bona fide business discussion. In other words, it was really a form of entertainment. But if you're traveling away from home and you're claiming meal expenses while you're traveling away from home, then the IRS says you can claim either the daily per diem rate or the actual cost of the travel away from home for meals. The standard meal allowance covers the cost of your daily meals plus incidental expenses while you are traveling away from home on business. Incidental expenses include costs for fees and tips given to porters, baggage carriers, bellhops, hotel maids, stewards, and stewardesses. Transportation between places of lodging or business and places where meals are taken. If suitable meals can be obtained at the temporary job site and Mailing costs associated with filing travel vouchers and payment of employer-sponsored charge card billings. But incidental expenses do not include expenses for laundry, cleaning, and pressing of clothing, lodging taxes, or the cost of telegrams or telephone calls. Per diem rates. Daily per diem rates vary according to the city and country you are residing in. And you can basically go online and look up the federal per diem rates anytime you want. For most of the country, the rate is going to be a low $46 a day, and ultimately the deduction you get is half that, 50% of $46. But if you travel to a high-cost area, you may be allowed a higher rate, and some examples of higher rate cities are shown here. Los Angeles, Seattle, Las Vegas, Chicago, Washington, D.C., those are all $71 a day cities. Portland, Oregon, Philadelphia, and San Antonio, Texas, $66 a day. Milwaukee and Salt Lake City, $61 a day. Virginia Beach, Virginia, and Vancouver, Washington are both at $56 a day. So if you're able to show that you travel to a city that has a higher cost than the normal $46 a day, then you can go with that higher amount. And I've just done a cutout here from one of the websites. They're not maintained by the IRS. They're maintained by other departments of the federal government. But all you have to do is in your search engine type federal per diem rate or foreign per diem rate. So on federal per diem rate or foreign per diem rate. You type in either of those searches and you're going to pull up what you're looking for. So now, although we're pointing out here that you may get a higher rate for a specific city, it happens to be the case that when you go into those websites to pull out the actual per diem rate allowed, they will allow more than just the city. And in this case, we have a per diem rate for the city of Phoenix as well as Scottsdale. But you may not be in either of those cities as long as you're still in Maricopa County. And if you are in Maricopa County, then you would still get the $71 a day rate. I did want to point out to you here that we have three columns, 77, 66, and 143. And essentially, if you take 77 and add 66, you do get 143. And you might be saying, well, where does that come from? Well, essentially, this is the daily lodging rate in this column, the furthest left column. But the daily lodging rate is not something that a sole proprietor would ever claim for themselves. It is an amount that they can pay out to an employee to cover an employee's travel expenses as a non-taxable 
payment to that employee. So if you have an employee that you send to Austin, Texas to work on a project for two weeks, and while they're there, you're giving them a daily per diem rate for lodging, that daily per diem rate that you gave to your employer is going to be deductible to you. And the employee is then left on their own to spend the money on lodging. They might choose expensive lodging or they might choose cheap lodging, but if they spend less than they're given, they could technically keep it. Per diem rate for travel outside of the United States, the continental United States, the standard mileage allowance rates for CONUS do not apply to travel in Alaska, Hawaii, or any other location outside of the continental United States. So all of these rates that I've been showing you here have to do with CONUS. CONUS is continental United States. If you travel outside of CONUS, the rates go up. And I did want to show you an example of what you'll find for outside of CONUS rates. Here is a link. You can go to the Defense Travel or Department of Defense Travel website for information on foreign per diem rates. And here we have Vancouver, Canada. The daily per diem rate for meals alone in Vancouver, Canada is $124 a day. Not as bad as London, however. London is $180 a day. Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, $91 a day. Hong Kong, $139 a day. The island of Kauai, $105 a day. And Fairbanks, Alaska, $82 a day. There is a rule about per diem rates for the days leaving or returning. For travel days to and from a business trip, you must prorate your standard meal allowance, and you can do so by one of two methods. Under method number one, you can claim three quarters of the standard meal allowance, and under method two, you can prorate using any method that you consistently apply and that is in accordance with reasonable business practices. 50% limit on meals and entertainment. If you claim meal or entertainment expenses on your tax return, whether or not you're claiming actual expenses or the daily per diem rate, you're still going to have to apply the 50% limit. There is an exception to that, and that exception is if you are in the transportation industry. If you are in the transportation industry, you can deduct 80% of your business-related meal expenses if you incur the meal expense while subject to Department of Transportation hour of service limits. These limits generally affect the following categories of workers, airline pilots and flight attendants, train conductors, and interstate truckers. In addition to being allowed to claim 80% of meal expenses, workers who are subject to hours of service limits are allowed to use the higher daily rates than the $46 a day. So they could go to the individual cities that they work in, as say as a trucker, and figure out what the higher rate is for each of those cities that they were in for part of the day. But that's kind of a lot of work more work than is really required. IRS says simply take the higher per diem rate, which for truckers inside of the United States is $59 a day for all of 2012, and you would go with that number instead of $46 a day. But in addition to the $59 a day, we still have to apply a limit. And in this case, the limit is not 50% of the expense, rather it's 80% of the expense. So truckers do get a larger deduction than people who are not in the transportation business. Amtrak Act for Interstate Transportation Wage Protection. If you are a transportation worker as defined under the Amtrak Act, your income from work performed in more than one state is protected from taxation by more than one state. So this particular act is not a part of federal tax law, but it does influence what states can tax. So just imagine you've got a long haul trucker. That trucker starts his route in San Francisco. He have to work his way across the country through Kansas and all of the central states until he finally gets across to the East Coast and he makes a delivery, say, in the Virginia area. How do you figure at the state level how much the states would be taxing him? Because he's getting paid hourly traveling in each state that he drives through. And in the olden days, before the Amtrak Act came into being law, states were trying to tax people who are interstate transportation workers based on the amount of time they spent driving through their state. And so the Amtrak Act prevents those states from doing that. I'm going to slip past the Amtrak Act and move down to entertainment expenses next. You can deduct ordinary and necessary entertainment expenses provided they are directly related to business or associated with business. Directly related to business. To meet the directly related test, all of the following must be true. You expect to derive income or some other specific business benefit other than goodwill at some future time, but it is not necessary to demonstrate that you actually receive the benefit. 
you actively engage in a business meeting discussion or other bona fide business transaction with the person being entertained, and your principal purpose of the combined business entertainment activity is the active conduct of a trader business. But it is not necessary to devote more time to business than to entertainment to meet this requirement. So to meet the directly related test, you have to expect some income or other specific business benefit from entertaining the person. And you need to actively engage in a business meeting discussion or other bona fide business transaction with the person you're entertaining. And the principal purpose of the business meeting is the conduct of your business. If you meet those tests, then the entertainment expense is deductible. But you can might imagine that we have entertainment associated with business that maybe isn't directly related with business and is entertainment that's just kind of closely associated with business still deductible. And the IRS says, yes, it can be. If your activity does not meet the directly related test, you may still have a deduction if you can satisfy the following two conditions. The activity has a clear business purpose or the entertainment directly proceeds or follows a substantial business discussion. So you have to have a business purpose to the meeting and it has to immediately follow or proceed a substantial business discussion. If it meets that parameter, then you can still claim it. Separating travel and meal expense. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've certainly noticed that QuickBooks seems to have a category called travel and entertainment or travel and meals. And that creates a problem because it's basically directing the person who's doing the bookkeeping to allocate all travel and entertainment expenses to the same account. And that creates a problem because, of course, meal expense is only 50% deductible. And if it's mixed in with lodging and other travel expenses, it can be a nightmare trying to pull it out. So you need to, though. Line 25 of Schedule C is where we report the cost of utilities. The only thing I really have to say about utilities is kind of self-evident what a utility is. But you would never enter a deduction for utilities paid as a part of a home office expense on Line 25 because you would enter that amount on 8829, the office use of home form, instead. Wages, enter the total salaries and wages you paid to employees for the tax year. Do not include salaries and wages deducted elsewhere on your return or amounts paid to you. Reduce your deduction by any wage credits that you claimed. Your employees may include your spouse and children or any other person whom you hire to work in your business. If you provided compensation to your employees during the year, you are subject to additional reporting requirements. So essentially, on your Schedule C, you can claim a deduction for wages paid, and it is okay to employ your spouse, and it's okay to employ your children. And in fact, one of the key benefits of a Schedule C is that you can employ your spouse and you can employ your children. You can issue them W-2s, and it happens to be that if the children are under the age of 18, you don't have to pay Social Security or Medicare tax on the wages that you pay them. So you could have a situation where you're able to take a nice size deduction for money that you're paying to your children. Line 27A is other expenses on the Schedule C. The other expense line of this form allows you to give descriptions and amounts to other types of expenses you had which do not fit into the categories provided on lines 8 through 26. You should use as many categories as you feel are necessary to accurately describe the expenses you are claiming. Do not use the category miscellaneous, however, because if your expense does not have a category, then what you should be doing is describing the category. And lots of times my clients will bring me a profit and loss or their version of a profit and loss, and on it they'll have miscellaneous and some big number, $5,000. Well, I'm never satisfied with the word miscellaneous because the IRS is not satisfied with the word miscellaneous. It's rather meaningless. We need to actually break that out and figure out what it is. So if the expense that has been allocated as miscellaneous is in fact, say, internet access. You could put internet access as a utility, but maybe you've got website maintenance. Are you going to call the website maintenance marketing or advertising and put it on the advertising line? Maybe you're not quite sure, so you stick it on the other income line. But I would never put it into a category called miscellaneous. Total expenses before business use of your home. So we're going to take up all of the amounts entered on lines 8 through 27. And when we do that, we total them up and enter that total on line 28. And then we have on line 29 where we enter our tentative profit or loss and we're simply going to take the total amount of income entered earlier on the form. We're going to subtract out the amount on line 28 and then on line 29 we have our total income. But we're not done. Now it's time to figure business use of home if we did use our home for business. 
So the next point on the line is to claim home office expense. You can see right here it says line 30, expenses for business use of home. We're going to enter our total income. We're going to enter our total expenses. We're going to get a total on line 29 that is our tentative profit. And then we move over to line 31. If we're going to claim a home office expense, this is the line where it is entered. So line 31, if it is a profit, you're going to enter that profit on Form 1040, line 30. You may be able to deduct certain expenses for your business use of home. And if you claim business use of home, you have to attach the 8829, which is coming up. So we're going to talk about business use of home in just a second. For now, after you figure your office use of home expense on line 30, you're going to subtract that out. And in line 31, you have your profit. And you would carry that profit to line 12 of the Form 1040. Then on line 32, it asks, are you at risk? You answer yes or no. Yes is I am at risk. You would check a box on line 32A. And if you're not checking 32A because you're not at risk, you would check 32B. And then you have to attach a 6198 to your return. Now the next topic in line is cost of goods sold. I was saying that we would come to office use of home, but office use of home is apparently coming after cost of goods sold, so we'll do cost of goods sold first. Generally, if you engage in a trade or business in which the production or purchase or sale of merchandise was an income producing factor, you must take inventories into account at the beginning and ending of your tax year to figure your cost of goods sold. And here we have cost of goods sold, and you start off on line 33 by selecting the method that you use to value your inventory. If you are a cash basis taxpayer with average annual sales of $1 million or less over the past three years, you are not required to account for your inventory. However, if you choose not to report your opening and closing inventory, you may not claim the cost of materials and other inventory items as a supply cost until the year that you sell them. So I'm trying to think, maybe you have a repair shop for cars. And in the ordinary course of a year, you're going to have to buy a few parts to put in those cars that you're repairing. This is a service-oriented business. People who come in, they're paying you for your services. You charge for your time. But incidental to charging for your time, you also have certain supplies and parts that you need to buy to put into the cars that you're repairing. And do I have to do cost of goods sold in that situation? The answer is no. You don't need to do cost of goods sold in that situation, but... The IRS does say you still need to track the amount that you're paying for the supplies that you're using, and you aren't allowed to claim a deduction for any supplies that you haven't used up yet during the year. And here is an example of that very situation. A small business may choose to expense the cost of sales. You operate a heating and cooling business, and your gross sales are under a million dollars. You can choose to claim the cost of the furnace you are selling and installing for a customer by deducting the furnace as a supply on line 22 of the Schedule C. However, you may only claim the cost of the furnace as an expense in the year that you sell it to your customer. You may not claim a deduction for the cost of the furnace that you bought but have not yet sold. Inventories. Generally, if you produce, purchase, or sell merchandise in your business, you must keep inventory and use the accrual method for purchases and sales of merchandise. However, the following taxpayers can use the cash method of accounting even if they produce, purchase, or sell the merchandise. These taxpayers can also account for inventory items as materials and supplies that are not incidental. And then we have a qualifying taxpayer and a qualifying small business taxpayer. Those are the people who don't have to keep inventory or track cost of goods sold and can just enter a supply expense instead. A qualifying taxpayer is a taxpayer whose annual gross receipts for each prior year ending on or after December 17, 1998 is a million dollars or less. And a qualifying small business taxpayer is a business whose average annual gross receipts for each year prior to the year ending on or after December 31, 2000 is more than a million but not more than 10 million and your principal business activity is an eligible business. So in effect, what I said earlier at the start of class today, most small businesses are not going to be required to track inventory. It doesn't hurt to do it. It's a more accurate way of tracking business income and expenses. And so whenever I'm working with a client, I do ask those questions to try and figure out those numbers. But if you've just not kept cost of goods sold or entered cost of goods sold on a Schedule C in the past, odds are you didn't have to until the business gets to be a fairly substantial size. Now, there is supposed to be an averaging going on. You're looking to see what the average was over the last three years, and if the average is a million dollars or less, 
then you're not required to track inventory. If you haven't been in business long enough to have an average over three years, the IRS is average over the period of time you have been in business. Materials and supplies that are not incidental. If you account for inventory items as materials and supplies that are not incidental, you will deduct the cost of the items you would have otherwise included in inventory in the year that you sell the items or the year that you pay them, whichever is later. If you are a producer, you can use any reasonable method to estimate the raw material in your work in process and finished goods on hand at the end of the year to determine the raw material used to produce the finished goods that were sold during the year. So what Iris is saying is, if you're in the business of manufacturing a product and you have all these raw goods coming in, as long as you're able to track those goods and show how they're being used, you can use any reasonable method of tracking that. They're not going to tell you how you need to go about tracking that as long as the method you use makes sense to your business and is accurate. Changing the accounting method. If you are a qualifying taxpayer or qualifying small business taxpayer and you want to change your accounting method to account for inventory items as non-incidental materials and supplies, you do need to file Form 3115. So I've been talking to you a little bit about the background on inventory and some of the rules around it. And for most of our clients, they're not really that relevant. What we need to know is that if we are going to track inventory, what goes into inventory? What makes up inventory? And the IRS says, if you are required to account for inventories, you will include the following items when you are accounting for your inventory. Merchandise or stock in trade. Also raw materials, work in progress. Finished products and supplies that physically become a part of the item that is intended for resale. So inventory can be two things. Perhaps you're in a retail business, and so you've got retail items that you're bringing into your business from suppliers. You're putting those inventory items on your shelf. That makes it pretty simple to determine what your inventory is at any one time. You just need to count it. You're also bringing in the inventory and you're showing invoices for having purchased it. And at the end of the year, you'll do a count and see how much inventory you have left. But if you're a manufacturer and you're producing a product for resale, inventory is going to include a lot more. Because you're going to be looking at a whole bunch of things, like the utilities necessary to run the plant where the manufacturing goes on. You're going to look at the cost of shipping the product into your plant. You're going to be looking at the labor necessary to manufacture your product. A lot of different things are playing into hand, and the IRS says that all of those are part of the cost of goods sold. I see a question coming here. My client built a residential rental house and then sold it and now plans to build another. I plan to consider the house built as inventory. Is that correct? The answer is, yeah, I'd agree with that standpoint. I'm trying to think, you really got a home construction business there, don't you? And they may not be constructing very many at a time, only one, but the business is constructing a home. And so when that house is built and everything that goes into the building of that house, including utilities and auto and all of that, that's all part of the cost of goods sold on that house. So that would be the way I would handle it. Another one that I run across is fixer flippers. And I would think that maybe some fixer flippers could be coming into popularity again. They were super popular here in Portland in the 90s. And then they faded away. They're still around in the 2000s, but not as popular as they were in the 90s. 90s, the housing prices were pretty cheap and people were going in there. They'd buy these old fixer uppers and fix them up and then sell them to make money from the sale. And my estimation of that situation is, do we have a business which is fixing and flipping, or do we have an investment activity where we have capital gain income? And clearly, the person who is fixing these fixer flippers up and then selling them is hoping they're going to have a capital gain income that would not be exposed to self-employment tax and the higher ordinary income rates, and that perhaps if they hold it for a year or more than a year, they'll get the lower capital gain rates. So I've actually talked to the IRS about how do we identify when we have a fixer flipper that is self-employment and we have a fixer flipper that could just be considered to be a capital gain item. And the IRS people that I've talked to have essentially said, you're going to look to the frequency. If we've got a one-off event, you know, in 2000 and then in 2003 there was another and then in 2010 there was another, that's not going to be enough in the eyes of the IRS to say that there's a business going on. But if they see that you do a fixer flipper in June and then you do another fixer flipper in November, that's looking more and more like a business. And so you'd have to be careful about that. So let's talk about the uniform capitalization rules and then we will take a break. 
Under the uniform capitalization rules, you must capitalize the direct costs and part of the indirect costs for production or resale activities. Include these costs on the basis of property you produce or acquire for resale, rather than claiming them as a current deduction. You recover the cost through depreciation, amortization, or cost of goods sold when you sell, use, or otherwise dispose of the property. Activities that are subject to the uniform capitalization rules. You may be subjected to the uniform capitalization rules if you do any of the following unless the property is produced for your use other than in a business or an activity carried on for a profit. And that includes you produce real or intangible personal property. And for this purpose, tangible personal property also includes film, sound, recordings, videotape, book, or similar property, or you acquire the property for resale. There are some exceptions, and the uniform capitalization rules do not apply to the following types of property. Personal property you acquire for resale if your average annual gross receipts are $10 million or less. Property you produce if you meet either of the following conditions, either your indirect cost of producing the property are $200,000 or less, or you use the cash method of accounting and do not account for inventories. There are also some special methods of accounting for certain items of income or expense, and these include amortization, business bad debts, depletion, depreciation, installment sales. And line 33, the method used to value your closing inventory. So the IRS is saying when you're getting into cost of goods sold, you need to tell us what your opening inventory is, what your purchases were during the year. It wants to know what method you use to calculate the value of your closing inventory. And the three choices available for calculating the cost of your closing inventory include cost, lower of cost, or market, and retail. When it comes to valuing your inventory, you must value your inventory at the beginning and end of each tax year to determine your total cost of goods sold. To determine the value of your inventory, you will need to use a method for identifying the items in your inventory and a method for valuing these items. Inventory valuation rules cannot be the same for all kinds of businesses. The method you use to value your inventory must conform to generally accepted accounting principles for similar businesses, and it must clearly reflect your income for inventory practices, and they must be consistent year to year. So what IRS is saying is, okay, you've got a requirement to track inventory in your business. You need to have a specific plan in place about how you're going to go about tracking the value of that inventory that you have, and that you need to use that same method every year. Line 34 of Schedule C, was there any change in determining quantities, costs, or valuations between the opening and closing inventory? So if at the end of 2011, you did your inventory count one way, and then in 2012, you did it another way, that would be a change. And the IRS says if you do make a change, you need to enter the result of the change on line 35 and then attach an explanation. Inventory at the beginning of the year. Your opening inventory should be the same as your closing inventory from the prior year, unless this is your first year in business. For purchases, we're talking purchases less the cost of items withdrawn for personal use. Obviously, if you spent $10,000 on inventory items and then you held out $500 of those inventory items to use for personal purposes, you cannot include that part that you used for personal as an inventory expense. It has to come out. Cost of labor, do not include any amount as a cost of labor that you paid yourself but you would enter on line 37 the cost of wages that you paid to employees to manufacture or sell your product. Line 38 is for materials and supplies. The cost of materials and supplies used to manufacture your product. For example, food used by a restaurant or materials used by a production line would go there. Line 39, other costs. Enter other costs related to the sale of goods. Include the cost of shipping inventory items in, but do not include the cost of shipping inventory out. So that's one of the things I've always found rather interesting is you have the cost of your inventory would always include the cost of getting your inventory item delivered to you. Whatever the company that sells you that inventory charges you to ship you that inventory, it becomes a part of your cost of purchases. But when you finally turn around and sell an inventory item and you incur costs for shipping that item out, the cost of shipping that item out is not an inventory cost. Then on line 41, you enter your cost of all inventory you had on hand at the end of the year, and you'd have to do an inventory account to determine what that is. Line 42, finally, we have the cost of goods sold. Your cost of goods sold is calculated by subtracting your closing inventory from the total of your opening inventory and all other expense amounts that you added to inventory for the year. 
And I see here another question. Elena is saying, what about the cost of insurance on the house being sold and utilities? I would consider those all part of cost of goods sold. All of the cost of holding the home, fixing up the home, would all be part of cost of goods sold. That's my opinion. Okay, everyone, if coming back from break, if I do see a question coming from Anne, and she's saying, are you saying, April, that if my client builds one residential house every 18 months or so, that that could be a capital asset produced and therefore record that profit or loss as a capital gain and not have SE income? He is otherwise employed full time. I don't think I would say that with a, a construction business. If you're buying vacant land and you're building a house on that vacant land, you're developing it and you're selling it, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination I would call that a Schedule D item. What I'm referring to when I say a fixer flipper is you go and you buy a house and the house is kind of run down. So you decide you're going to buy it because it's cheap and it's cheap because it's run down. And so then you fix it up. So after you fix it up, it's worth more. And so then you sell it. And the IRS has identified what that is. And the industry kind of has a name for that too. The real estate industry it does. And it's called a fixer flipper. And the IRS does address fixer flippers. If you go in and read some of the publications and some of the revenue rulings, they'll talk about fixer flippers. And essentially, the IRS, in many cases, would consider a fixer flipper, something that you've gone in, bought, fixed up, and then resold, as a business enterprise. If that's something that you're regularly engaged in and doing on a regular basis, it would be considered to be self-employment. But they're saying also, the auditors that I've talked to, that they look at the frequency of fixer flippers. And if you're only doing one fixer flipper every other year or every three years, they don't consider that to be enough to be a business, and they would allow that fixer flipper to be reported on Schedule D or through 8949. But definitely, if you're in the business of constructing homes, you're buying empty lots, you're building a house on them, I would consider that to be a completely different thing. So back from our break, we're going to move on to the next topic, which is information on your vehicle, because we've moved out of cost of goods sold and into <laughs> uh, part four, where we enter information about the vehicle. And vehicles are an area that the IRS is all over. If you are ever audited or if you're ever in an audit with a client, one of the first things that the auditor is going to be asking questions about is the vehicle. Has that client maintained any kind of records? as required to support their business use of their vehicle. And right off, I can tell you that if the IRS does not see the necessary mileage log, the first thing they're going to do is throw that deduction out. In the worst case scenario, I've seen a person who, who actually had a corporation that they were the sole owner of, and they were claiming business use expenses for their vehicle or for a vehicle on the corporate return. And then they didn't have a mileage log to prove those expenses. And so it got even worse. The IRS basically said that the vehicle had a certain amount of business use, but you can't prove any of it. So we're going to treat all of the use on that vehicle as personal use. And since it's personal use of a company car, that needs to be a taxable fringe benefit to you, business owner. And that was never reported on your W-2. So we need to throw it on the W-2 and make the company pay a bunch of payroll tax on it. So <laughs> that's the worst case scenario. Not only did the company not get a deduction, the IRS said it was income and threw it into income of the worker. So it was just terrible. So you cannot emphasize to your clients enough the importance of maintaining good records when it comes to auto expenses. And of course, you also have to report information about the vehicle use in part four of Schedule C if you are filing a Schedule C return. Now, if you don't use Part 4, because you don't always have to use Part 4, you might do Form 4562 Part 5 instead. So Part 4 information on your vehicle. Use this part only if you used your car for your business and you were otherwise not required to file Form 4562. You can use Part 4 of Schedule C if you are claiming the standard mileage rate or you lease your vehicle or your vehicle is fully depreciated and you are not required to file Form 4562 for any other reason. If you use more than one vehicle during the year, you need to attach your own schedule with the information requested on Schedule C in Part 4 for the additional vehicles. So let's just see what Part 4 is asking for. It says, information on vehicles, complete this part only. If you are claiming car or truck expenses on Line 9 of Schedule C, and you are not required to file Form 4562 for this business. As soon as 4562 is required for any other reason, you leave Part 4 of Schedule C blank and you put the auto information on the 4562 instead. And you can see what Part 4 is asking for. When did you place the vehicle in service for your business? 
total number of miles that you drove your vehicle during 2012, the number of business miles, the number of commute miles, and the total of other miles that are not commute or business. Then it says, was your vehicle available for personal use during your off-duty hours? Now, clearly, the only way you're going to learn out the answer to this is to ask the client the question. And that's part of what goes on with many preparers is they just don't bother asking the questions, and so they'll either leave them blank and not answer them, or they'll just make up answers, and neither of those are ethical or competent. So you do need to ask your client, was the vehicle available for personal use during your off-duty hours? Do you have another vehicle available for personal use? Do you have evidence to support your deduction? And if you do have evidence, is it written? In other words, in the form of a mileage log. Form 4562 is required. You must use Form 4562 Part 5 if you are claiming depreciation on your vehicle or you are otherwise required to file Form 4562 for any other reason. You must provide information about the business use of your auto and if you do it on Form 4562, you're going to do it right here in Section B, Information on Use of Vehicles. Complete this section for vehicles used by a sole proprietor, partner, or other more than 5% owner or related person. If you provided vehicles to your employees, first answer the questions in Section C to see if you meet an exception for completing this section for those vehicles. Section C is not here. It's at the bottom of Form 4562, and it essentially applies when an employer provides a vehicle for an employee. But if we're doing a sole proprietor tax return, filing Schedule C, and the business vehicle being claimed is the vehicle belonging to the owner of the business, then we would enter that in Section B. It's got similar information that it's asking for, but it provides space for more than one car. You can see up to six vehicles can be listed here. They want the total business miles driven, the total commute miles, total of all other personal miles, then the total miles for all purposes during the year. And then was the vehicle available for personal use during off-duty hours? Was the vehicle used primarily by a more than 5% owner or a related person? And is any other vehicle available for personal use? And finally, we're on to Part 5, where we enter other expenses. The only thing we do in Part 5 is list other expenses that will then carry to Part 2, but we're listing them in Part 5 because Part 2 doesn't have any other line to describe them on. And some examples of the other types of expenses you might put in Part 5, I've put internet access fees, subscriptions, continuing education, web design. You might think of some other places to put those. And you could also get into discussion about whether or not website design is a capitalized expense that needs to be depreciated over time or amortized over time. In this situation, I'm saying, you know, it's just ongoing maintenance of the website, and therefore it would be deductible, 575. Another item you might list in Part 5 of Schedule C is business gift expense. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the rules relating to giving business gifts. You can deduct up to $25 per year per client for the cost of gifts you give in the course of your trade or business. Gifts you give to family members of a customer are considered to have been gifts given to that customer directly. Now, uh, that's not a very big number. I'm allowed to give $25 per year per client. That's not a lot. It's not hard to beat that number. One decent bottle of wine and you're done. You're certainly not going to get them tickets to a sporting event or anything like that for under $25. But there is an exception to the $25 rule, and that exception applies if the gift you gave is an item that cost $4 or less and has your name clearly and permanently imprinted upon the gift and is one of a number of identical items that you widely distribute. Examples include pens, desk sets, and plastic cases. Signs, display racks, or other promotional material to be used on the business premises of the recipient also do not fall under that $25 dollar rule. So when we're thinking of signs on the business premises, I'm really thinking of a point of purchase display. And so if you are running a business, say a retail business, and a manufacturer has come in and they're giving you to set up on your floor of your store a very elaborate point of purchase display, the IRS says even though they gave that to you and it's worth more than $25, it would not be income to you. But if you are the business that gave the property over, you're going to be allowed to deduct it in full, even if it has a cost of over $25. And here we have a class exercise to see if you are paying attention to how all of those numbers come together. I'm going to just create a quick poll here. The question is, Jacob gave the following business gifts during the year, and what is Jacob's gift deduction? 
Mike a business client. He gave him a $15 gift, and then he turned around and gave Mike's wife another $15 gift. Then he has a corporate buyer with four staff members, and he gave a total cost to those four staff members $100. And then Janice is a business client that he gave a gift valued at $75. What is the allowable gift deduction that Jacob is going to be allowed to claim? Applying that rule that says the deduction that you claim for a gift cannot be more than $25 a year. The answer is $150. Mike and his wife are a single person. So even though he gave $30 gift combined between them, he's only going to be allowed to deduct $25. And then there's the four staff members of the corporate buyer. We're assuming $25 per person there and $100 is going to be allowed. And then we have Janice, who is a business client. We're going to get $25 for her $75 gift. So we'll take 25 plus 25 plus 100 and that gives us our $150 answer. And another expense that you might enter on that last section, that Section 5 part of Schedule C, is work-related education expenses. It's not at all uncommon for a business owner to need to obtain and to spend money on continuing education, work-related education. And the question is whether or not that educational expense is deductible on the return. And I do see a question here. What do I think about a bottle of wine or sporting events tickets as a gift? As long as they're under $25, they're going to be allowed. <laughs> as long as there's a business purpose to the gift. You know, you've got a business client there, or maybe you've got an employee of your business, you're giving them a gift. Actually, when you're dealing with employees, you're dealing with taxable fringe benefits and whether or not you can give a gift at all and the value of it. So employees are a little bit different. So if you're giving a gift to a non-employee, it's about $25 a year. What I said about a bottle of wine is not that you can't get one for less than $25, because clearly you can get two buck chuck down in California for $2, and it's not even a bad wine apparently. But if you're buying a nice bottle of wine, and you go to Costco and you decide to pick out a nice bottle of wine, 25 is a long way from a really good bottle of wine. So maybe you buy a $100 bottle of wine. You want to really impress your client. Is that $100 bottle of wine deductible? Well, the answer is $25 of the cost of $100 is deductible. You wouldn't be allowed to deduct more than $25 for that particular gift. So the illustration that we just did right here is to demonstrate that you can give a gift valued at more than $25. It's just that your deduction will be limited to $25. Work-related education expenses are the next thing. To be deductible, your education expense must be required by your employer to keep your present salary status or job or serve a bona fide business purpose or maintain or improve skills needed in your present line of work. Even if these tests are met, you cannot claim a deduction for your education costs if they are needed to meet the minimum educational requirements of your present trade or job or are part of a program of study that can qualify you for a new occupation. So IRS says, in order to deduct education expenses on Schedule C or on Schedule A either, they need to be related to your business, and they need to be directly related in such a way that you can show how your business benefits because you paid for those educational expenses. And no matter what, those education expenses that you're paying for cannot qualify you to enter into a new occupation. No double benefit is allowed as well. So it could be that you're attending some educational programs that you are able to deduct on Schedule C because you are able to show that they are business related, but that those same expenses are also eligible, say, for the Lifetime Learning Credit or the American Opportunity Credit. And the IRS says if there's more than one way to claim your educational expenses, you cannot claim the same expense in two ways. But you can claim whichever one is beneficial to you or the most beneficial. So if you do pay for educational expenses, what costs are deductible? Where you're able to deduct the cost of tuition, books, supplies, lab fees, and similar items, as well as certain transportation and travel costs, other educational expenses such as research costs, typing costs, etc. And with regards to transportation, you can claim the cost of traveling to and from school as follows. If you are going to school on a temporary basis that is one year or less, you can deduct the cost of traveling from work to school and from school to home. If you are going to school for more than a year, you can deduct the cost of going directly from work to school only. Subspace, S-U-B-S-P-A-C-E. Subspace, 